If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Okay. This is what this is the third time we've had Lane on the show. Is Always it three? fun because he's probably one of the most polarizing people that we bring on our show. This this episode, a lot of love, a lot of hate it for our boy. This episode had the most uh, like like information, like nutrition information, science information. This I think is, in, in my opinion, I'm going to say this is like diet talk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. If you're I into didn't... diet talk, you know, have fun with this. I one. didn't even ask you how you felt about this one. So, this was not a favorite. Oh, it was a snooze fest. Oh, wow. Big time for yeah. me. Wow. So, this was not a favorite because for me. Because we you. didn't talk so much about his personal That's life. That's funny and because stuff. this was a favorite for me. Well, me too. I know because it's in your guys' realm of like, you know, really optimizing your diet and like, you know, it, I mean, it, it was compelling information if like that's what, you know, drives you. So, I could see that. But yeah, yeah. for me, it was like. Oh, wow. I didn't uh, even think about comatose. that for you because it was, it was such a, uh, it was so much my favorite favorite episode with Lane so far that I just assumed that we all thought that, but I didn't even think that Justin may not enjoy it as much as we no, did. No, he got real deep into science and macros and reverse dieting. That was great talk on reverse dieting. Oh, this I is thought. a this is a great one for that. Yeah, I think yeah. I think people that we and we get nutrition questions all the fucking time. And I for I finally feel like what is this, the third or fourth time now that we've interviewed Lane and we've been around him several times now. I finally feel like he's really comfortable. Yeah. He was the most comfortable for sure. Right. Didn't you feel that way? Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, so I think it was by far the best just because of that, because I didn't feel his, like every other time I felt nervous energy from him. Right. And this, I really felt like we all just fucking hung out, had a great, good, deep conversation related to nutrition and all kinds of other stuff that I thought was really good. We got, yeah, we got Dr. Lane Norton on this one, whereas the other ones we talked more about personal stuff yeah. and his life and it was a good yeah. The other ones I felt like we were kind of poking at him more. Yeah. Although don't give me not, not, don't not worry. Bad. I still jabbed him plenty of times. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny that the mutual respect uh, that we have for him and, and and vice versa is really awesome. He is a good, generally a good person, honest person. Can be polarizing because he's very passionate and opinionated. Yeah, but um, good information. And you know what? He talked about a lot of things that were mind pump kind of esque. In this episode, that talked about I in, found very interesting. Yeah, talked about intuitive eating a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we talked a little bit of some stuff that we that we find kind of fascinating. But anyway, it was a really really good episode. He came here with Holly, his girlfriend. Um, she's not on this episode, but I did do a YouTube video with her discussing reverse dieting because this is a it's a fascinating topic. You know how to get your metabolism to essentially speed up, like get your body to burn more calories without gaining more body fat, which is a position I think a lot of people listening would want to be in. Uh, but anyway, you can find uh, Lane Norton on his own podcast. That's a physique science radio. His website is biolane.com. He's, he's on Instagram, excuse me, at biolane, I believe. Um, and I think that's uh, that's pretty much it, right? Well, we got the Holly video you just did too. That's going to be dropping. That's, right. that's on go. Mind Pump TV. The, on right. If YouTube. some of you guys, are, I, I don't, we still have people that don't uh, subscribe to the Mind Pump TV, which is on YouTube. That it's completely different content than what we put here. So I don't know if you know that. I think some people mm -hmm. think that it's just mirroring. different conversation. Different yeah, we topic. bring a lot of professionals on to give their you know awesome gems in there and like educate. So. That's right. And of course, I do want to mention if you are interested in any of our. MAPS fitness programs, uh, which are designed for specific goals, or if you're interested in like a nutrition guide or a fasting guide or how to do occlusion uh, on your on your arms and legs properly, uh, we have those all available as well. Those are all uh, on our website, mindpumpmedia.com. You can click on any of the programs and learn more about them. But uh, without any further ado, here we are interviewing Dr. Lane Norton. Adieu. We're all friends here. <laughs> yeah. It's a safe space. It's a safe, safe. space. Yeah. It is a very safe space. You guys who never like seen inside this show, like you're literally inside a box right now. Yeah, we we well, you hear next door how loud it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Say what? You know why it's all crazy next door? Why? It's, it's bomb proof. Today's, today's fucking what you call it? It's the uh, Memorial, Day. Memorial Day. Is it Murph? Oh, Murph. Oh, that's, right. that's why. Yeah, because oh, this right. is yeah, this is day he passed. Right? Dude, there's. Mm. Th I was wondering hey. why it was so crazy next door. I'm like, they normally have like five people over there right now. There's like a I huge see, party. No over wonder there. there's people wearing weight vests running out. Yes. Yeah, the oh, Murph. Oh yeah. yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, that's what they're doing. That's an awesome tribute, actually. Oh, yeah. if you know the story, it's brilliant. Is yeah. what it is. It's a brilliant, in my opinion. I mean, did, that's... You, did you guys read the book? No. no. Oh man, like the movie was good, but the book was awesome. Was it better? Lone Survivor. Yeah. 
Yeah. But that's, oh, that's, oh, you're talking about that? Oh, Lone Survivor. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's not, so, so that's not Crossfit. Murph. That's Marcus Luttrell. No, no, I know it is, but I believe. Oh, I've I read believe that. That's my favorite book, bro. The guy who died. That was, I believe that was Murphy. Oh, uh, was, was it? Was it his best friend? Was that Murphy? I thought so. I thought hmm. so. Oh, Maybe I a, got it wrong. That's a good question. You know what? I don't yeah, know if don't that's. Know. A, I don't know if that's the same guy or not. That's. I don't know that. Now that's gonna bug me. There you go. Yeah, no, Doug will pull it. Look up that up. That, Find yeah. out because if I'm talking shit, I don't want to disrespect anybody. No, no. Yeah, well, no, I don't no, think it's no. disrespect no matter what because I mean it's a tribute to them. And that talk about that's my favorite all time book. That's a fucking great book. It says how the event has grown. You're gonna have to scroll up there. Oh, that is him. Michael Murphy. Michael, yeah. yeah. No shit. You're all right, dude. Dude, I have, a, I have a Holly's like you're a fr- when it comes to memory. I'm, a, I'm kind of a freak. Yeah, I feel like, like I feel you. Yeah. I, I have a really photographic memory. Yeah. I just remember for things you shit. care about, though, right? Yeah, and just random shit. Yeah. Like yeah. I was like, they don't really teach history in Australian schools that much. So like, I was given a whole history lesson of like why World War One and World War Two started. And, Probably because Australia wasn't really involved. Yeah, actually, you know, their SAS, are, they're, they're actually pretty badass. Like, their special forces are actually legit. Oh, for sure. But they, they were involved. It's just, you know, in the, in the Pacific Theater, it's just that, you know, a country of 23 mil- with the same population as the state of Florida. Exactly. You, you only do so much. Exactly. Right? You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, and they're pretty laid back. Anyway. They had they're some like, fun. ah, mate, we, we uh, you know, let them fucking kill each other. Yeah. <laughs> they they had some boomerang attacks that really decimated <laughs> <laughs> Some dingery do uh, oh, battles. You know? Hey, yeah. I love the Australians, yeah. so let's be honest. That's they're sweet. actually big fans of our show, and I think it's because we cuss and, and we, our humor. Yeah. It's oh, so yeah. crazy. That's what they I love. Get it. That's what I love about them is you could, there's nothing there's inappropriate. They there. say cunt all the time. Yeah. It's like okay, their so favorite word. You have to Hang love on. people that say so it all the time. So Holly, Holly debates this, but Holly is a very, Holly is like a very proper person. Like when she talks, she curses more now that she's been around me, but she's like a very proper, she's like, oh no, people don't say cunt that much. I'm like, Bam. really? <laughs> like, she's like, well, maybe they're really feral people. She uses feral, uh, as, you know. Um, like gangster. Yeah, I'm like, I don't know, babe. When I went over there, everybody was like, ah, oh, you fucking sick cunt. You yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah. like it's well, so wait. funny because over here that word is like, oh. if you say that oh, word, yeah. like, you'll get needed in the balls Record like that. Record stop. It's, you know? it's, almost, it's almost like a racist word. Like, it's almost, yeah, it's almost yeah. like a word you just, pretty soon we'll just say the C word. You know what I mean? Yeah, like you yeah. can't say it. But in England and in, the, and in, uh, in Australia... I had our English friend, and every other word was cunt. I thought it was great. <laughs> yeah. That was wonderful. Yeah. For those listening, we can actually say this just because we're, we're actually talking about other people who say it. <laughs> yeah. So it's totally fine. You know. Oh, I Although it's not quite to the level of racist anyway. because you know you still don't you still don't feel okay repeating the N word. No. You know no, what no, I mean? No, like you, you, do, you don't feel safe. No. You know. But but anybody. See, here's the thing. Anybody can be a cunt. So yes. it's not it's not discriminatory at all. Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? Like. White, black, I feel like you man, could ar- woman. I feel like you could argue that with any word. Oh, they're all made up, anyways, dude. Yeah, yeah that's true. they're all made up words, that's anyways. You, I think I, I love Adam over there. It's just words, man. <laughs> it is. It's, words, man. <laughs> it's just fucking words, dude. Where did they come from, bro? Yeah. <laughs> you never hear sat and thought about. Have that? you seen? Have you watched uh, Monk debates yet? Monk debates. Oh, you've never seen that channel? You oh, you would love that, that shit, you will, dude. You will like it, bro. They take controversial subjects and then they take two experts from either side. And have them debate, but very intelligently. And so, like, I watched, I watched about forty minutes of one last night where it was about religion. Is religion more of a good force in the world or bad, or something like Ooh. that? And on one side, you had Tony Blair, who used to be the Prime Minister of uh, right. of the UK, who was also like a devout Catholic. Yep. And then you had Christopher Hitchens. This is before he passed away. Yeah, yeah. He's the He's author great. of uh, God, "God Is Not Great" or something like that, or, or yeah. whatever. Anyway, it's a fascinating uh, platform. Mm. Really, really cool stuff. You probably had enough, you'd like it. Yeah, that, that you know, so subjective. You know, I mean, I'd probably err on the side of. I think it's probably caused more harm. Oh, you good. think so? Oh, I disagree. Uh, yeah. It, I, listen, I could be swayed. Yeah. You know, because for some people, like I think on an individual, so I think a person is usually pretty smart. I think people tend to be fucking dumb. Mm. Uh, if you know what I mean, like groups of people oh, to I hear make what you're really saying. dumb decisions you're, you're right. and packs. You're right. You know it's I a mean? group mind. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, but an individual, I think I've seen a lot of individuals whose religion has made a really positive impact mm-hmm. in their life, you know, because for me, and I, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, it's just how I'm wired. Like, I don't need the idea of an afterlife to think that I should be a good person and live a good life mm. because it's just like, to me, it's like if you don't have anything afterwards, then it's fucking even more important that you do really well with this one, right? Yeah. But for some people, that 
kind of makes them despondent and the idea of something after that is what motivates them or even just a relationship with God well uh, I, a higher I, purpose I think it's important that you all you that people because I I was at one point I was atheist and I think mm. it's important for I'm not anymore but I think it's important oh, cool, for people to understand that their their basis of morality as much as they'd like to say it's not based in religion the true the reality is if you grew up in if you grew up in western society and you're you say look I'm ethical I'm moral those foundations where those come from those foundations came from in our in western societies from a judeo christian uh, background so like the concept of uh, individual liberty that is 100% a judeo christian creation um, uh, and the concept of do unto others and treat mm. people nicely and all that stuff because if we didn't have that and the evidence for this is the 20th century. If we don't have that foundation, humans do crazy shit. They do terrible stuff. What's one of the first things that totalitarian regimes do when they take control? They get rid of religion. They get rid of religion. You know, yeah. uh, the the fascists did this with you know Hitler and Mussolini, and and the communists did this with uh, you know uh, you know Mao of China and mm-hmm. Stalin, um, and and they eliminate that because. We and you can't. This is the thing. You can't separate like human nature from, because I hate it when we think like we can we can eliminate human nature. Human nature clearly shows that we we need to believe in something. So when you eliminate religion, then people tend to worship other things like money, sex, drugs, work, science, science. Waiting for the bad part. Yeah. I'm, I'm just I'm just kidding. <laughs> just, just, just just kidding. Yeah. So uh, that's that's it. But anyway, it's a great it's a great uh, it's a great platform. I fucking love it. I could I could see you going on there debating someone, uh, you know, in fitness and health or something like but that. But that's why we have Twitter. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're trying to get Sal into that. Yeah. I mean, don't you feel you like know, he fits really well in I, the Twitter scene? I actually think that Twitter is the most difficult social media in terms of you have to. You know, if you want to be intelligent, you have to like you have to be entertaining, intelligent, and do that in well now it's two hundred and eighty characters, mm-hmm. yeah. right? So that most people can't condense Little their words. thoughts down to that, but still retain the integrity of what they're trying to say. Mm. I feel like I'm pretty good on Twitter. Now I use fuck a lot. Like I use the F word. Actually, mm. somebody the other day was like, You really like like they're basically saying that I was, you know, not intelligent because I use the F word. I'm like, actually, the research says that people who are intelligent <laughs> tend to curse more, not less. Well, it's beyond. You know, I'm fu- just, I'm just the one that can do it because I don't have a boss. I'm my own boss, so I can say fuck all I Hold want. Hold on a second. I, I love question. my job. I say fuck all the time. Gotta, fuck, fuck, fuck. I got a question for you. Who are you responding to? Is it just a regular person on Twitter? Um, so not Some always. Twelve year old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lay just fucking crushes the twelve year old. I, I feel like you don't. Really like a I feel like you diet. get lessons thrown at you, the same lessons, and you just don't learn them. Like, <laughs> dude, dude, stop, enga- stop engaging with these trolls. Fuck. No, those. you know <laughs> what? 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 Uh, for a lot, well, it probably does I, good for business, though. I would think because it attracts attention. People, people. Th- let's be honest. People thrive off of the drama. I mean, oh, it's, yeah. you. I don't care. Everybody in here has seen fucking Maury Povich and Ricky Lake Ooh. and fucking Jerry Springer. Like we've all watched it before. No matter if you think it's trash TV or not, mm-hmm. you tune into it because people want to see drama. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So I want to know who the fuck. If you is. can find a way to educate through that, I think there's there's well, some value. I, to I it. realize that like when you're debating somebody who's already got their mind made up, you're not changing their mind. What I'm doing it for is like do the people. The people who are watching, yeah. my, my buddy, who's uh, my buddy Ed, who's into guns. He, like, he always says when he gets in a debate on Facebook about guns, he, he's not trying to change that person's opinion. He's just hoping that there's somebody who's watching who's maybe in the middle mm-hmm. about stuff, and maybe he can change their opinion. That's mm-hmm. how I look at it. With when I'm yeah. doing, like, I don't actually think, you know, I was debating with, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, every camp has kind of zealotry. You talk about people wanting to belong to something. Oh, yeah. Like, mm-hmm. so we worship other things. Well, that's all what, tribal. People, yeah, humans are tribal. So, like, I can give a great example of that, of that happening to me. Like, so I'm a gun guy. You guys know. Mm-hmm. Libertarian. Woo. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, uh, I was an NRA member for a while. And I don't have any problem with the NRA. I mean, I think in a way it's kind of a necessary evil to not evil, but kind of balance out the anti-gun sure. legislation that's out there. Because sure. for the love of God, if the NRA wasn't around, we probably would have already had all the guns taken away. Right. So, right. but like there is a certain narrative that goes along with being an NRA member that doesn't just have to do with guns. It's almost like a lifestyle mm-hmm. of conservatism, right? And I found myself kind of being like. 
starting to agree with more stuff that I didn't really actually agree with. Do you know what I mean? Like, because I felt being part of that group. And then I had to kind of check myself and be like, well, I don't fucking believe that. What am I, what am I talking about? Yes, pro guns, but fuck that thing, you know? So, um, but I can see how people get sucked into that, right? So I've, what I've found is like, I've kind of gone back, okay, what's the worst? The anti-artificial sweetener, zealots, no offense, Sal. Mm. Uh, <laughs> they, no, Sal's not a zealot. No. Um, the, the vegans, the, um, uh, the low carb, I got to tell you, I find the low carb zealots probably the most annoying. Well, that's just because it's right mm. now. Right now, yeah. the ketogenic yeah. diet is like the fucking... Oh, the they're, just, they're so sure of themselves. Well, mm-hmm. it's because of what's coming. It's what's what, we're, well, what we're seeing right now in the last yeah. year or two. Yeah. That's what, what you what, you know what strengthens it? The reason why they're, they're acting that way? Well, two things. First off, when people, uh, when people start to... Joe Rogan? When people start to dissolve... <laughs> we'll go there in a second if you want. <laughs> when people start to dissolve their, in, their individualism for collectivism... That's when you see people becoming zealots and starting to adopt what other people believe, even though they don't necessarily believe it themselves. Like, if the label conservatism means you 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 feel yeah. this way about all these different things, yeah. Liberal means you have to feel, and people yep. will end up putting themselves in that box because they start to adopt that that collectivist mentality. Very dangerous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a very dangerous thing to do. But with with low carb, part of the reason why they're so strong in their position, or there's a lot of zealotry there is because I feel like they're countering decades yeah. of shitty information when it comes to fat. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like if you want to if you want to strengthen zealotry, the best thing you could possibly do is is hit it with force or lots of <laughs> and then they'll just salt they'll just hunker down in their position. Yeah, you know there's actually a a study done that looked it was for political stuff, but it showed that uh, whether you gave someone evidence that supported their belief or countered their belief both were equally effective in strengthening their belief in that thing, Mm -hmm. right? So, like, one of the things I pride myself on is I think I'm relatively open-minded. Nobody's completely open-minded, and you probably shouldn't be because otherwise you just buy into everything, Mm -hmm. right? So one of my favorite things is be open-minded but not so open-minded that your brain falls out, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, Or stand stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Yeah, I mean, so it, you know, you've always kind of, you know, I kind of got myself a little bit painted into the IFYM, you know, count macros thing. Sure. But the reason I do that is because I think it's, you know, if you just restrict calories or track your macros, you're 90% of the way there for most stuff. Now, am I saying that you can get the same health benefits by doing, you know, eating absolute garbage foods as you can by eating single ingredient, whole foods, nutrient rich no, I'm not saying that, but I think most people would get a would get really damn far just doing that. Mm-hmm. That's right? debatable. Yeah. <laughs> sure it is. It's debatable. Sure it I, 90% is a strong number to say that. I, I'm I, just throwing. I would. I would. Well, I would argue that the the piece that's most neglected that people don't talk about enough is the psychological piece. Hundred percent. I think that that's ninety percent. I think the macros is ten percent or nine percent, and then everything else is one yeah. percent. That's what I. <laughs> well, think. think about it this. I way. think so much He's is right. So much is the psychological piece. Well, uh, anybody can follow something. Well, right? here, here, let's look at it this way, Lane. Why are why do why do why would I, for example, recommend whole foods uh, versus processed foods? Strap on. We're about to go down the rabbit hole. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, strap, no. strap in. Strap yeah, in. Not strap, strap on. Strap yeah, on. Yeah. Shit. Whoa. <laughs> that came out way too easy. That came out way too easy Fuck. for you, bro. What <laughs> have you been doing this weekend, uh, lady? What, yeah, yeah. What, what, what kids? A little pegging. Strap on. A little bit of a, little bit of a Freudian slip Yeah, I can't wait to Shit. talk to Holly later. Where's Holly? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, she'll be so embarrassed. Uh, she's, got, uh, she's got strong hips. I saw her deadlift. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Oh wow! We're I not thought, even ten minutes in already. Yes, uh, I thought you good. walked that way because your mobility was bad. But exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so no. So here's the deal: uh, Can processed foods be healthy? Definitely, but processed foods, in the speaking about the psychological aspect, are designed to be so hyper palatable. It's yep. so much more difficult to not overeat when your diet is comprised of these foods. And so the psychological piece is so important. Like if I tell someone, look, dramatically reduce your processed food intake, what's likely going to happen, and by the way, this is from experience, so I don't know if there's any studies done on this specific topic. This is just on my own experience. When people reduce their processed food intake, 
they tend to eat less because yeah. it's easy to eat 2,000 calories of potato chips. It's hard to eat 2,000 calories of plain white, you know, baked potato without salt or butter. You know what I'm saying? And I completely agree with you yeah. on that. Like, so this is this is the thing when I when I get in these debates on Twitter, I'll end up going around to, dude, we're, we're actually arguing the same thing. Yeah, yep. So the problem, my problem with low carb zealots is they they they'll say things reasonable like, oh, well, it helps with satiety and people tend to eat less. That is actually, satiety tends to be pretty individual. There's sure. some people who actually do better with higher carb, lower fat. However, it looks like low carb on the whole tends to be a li- do a little bit better. Mm-hmm. It tends to do a little bit better. And what I'll tell people is, that is a perfectly reasonable reason to do low carb. Absolutely 100%. If that helps you uh, like, like be more cognizant and reduce your intake... By all means, do low carb, but don't tell me it's magic because it's not magic. And don't say shit like calories don't count. Mm. Like when you start saying dumb shit like that, I'm going to call you on it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not anti-low carb. You guys know me. Oh, yeah. I have some people who do low carb. I have some people who do keto, right? Because that's what they actually enjoy. Mm-hmm. But just don't tell me it is magic because if you do that, then I'm going to call you on it. And that's, Agreed. that is more, so I was on uh mixed mental arts uh, a few weeks ago. Really oh, enjoyed that podcast. Is that, is that with Brian, uh, Callen? Brian Callen? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. fucking great guy. Really enjoyed that Love podcast. Him. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he actually said he had a man crush on me by the end, which was nice. Oh, oh very cool. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I'll be, I'll be honest. Like I booked the podcast um, to be blatantly honest not even knowing that who Brian Callen was. And oh, I, shit, you didn't know that? Yeah, I well, I'd heard the name, you know, but got on there, and I'm like, wait, this dude looks fucking familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like Googling on my phone while I'm doing the podcast. So I did that podcast while I had food poisoning. Like, literally had, had thrown up two hours before I did that podcast. Oh, oh shit. And I kind of told them, hey, um, yeah, you may not get my best effort, but I fucking pulled it together. I'm a gamer, and yeah. we had a great podcast, but we one of the things we talked about is he said, well... You know, he was kind of arguing a little bit more from the from the you know calories don't count so much mm-hmm. as, you know, if I, he's like if I tell somebody oh eat less processed foods, um, increase your your fat intake, decrease your carbohydrate intake, X Y Z, you you know that person will lose weight. And I said, yeah, absolutely, they probably will, but because they reduce their calorie intake, right? You, I've, I have seen it. I have done experiments on it. You can overfeed with keto and get somebody to gain body fat. Of course. 100%. Of course. So, like I said, it's now, honestly, I would feel <laughs> like you can only eat so much basically pure lard before you just feel like probably psych- more psychological than anything, but you just feel gross. Yeah. You know? Well, dude, you know what happened to me? Because I eat <laughs> relatively low carb most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time. It just works better for me and it feels better. But I also sometimes go very, very hard keto, especially when I come out of a fast. And something that I just learned recently, we had Dr. Michael Ruscio on the show. He's a gut health uh, specialist. Mm -hmm. Brilliant guy. You should have him on your show. He's a real smart dude. And he talked about histamine intolerance and how some people with gut issues can can develop issues where their body's just not getting rid of histamine fast enough, especially when they're consuming foods that are really high in histamine or that cause a release of histamine. Hmm. And those foods include things like avocado, bacon, beef jerky, peanuts, the foods that I eat all the fucking time. Ooh. And I was noticing these interesting effects where I was getting kind of brain fog. I wasn't feeling great. I'd crash after eating with my energy. And it, it took some time, but it started happening. Like, what's going on? Why am I feeling this way? So we talked about histamine intolerance. And really, there's no way to, to test for it except for remove the foods see what happens, and then maybe supplement with- A lot of gut health issues like that, elimination yep. diet, and yep. see what you add yep. back in. And so I did. I eliminated uh, all these high histamine foods, and I feel way fucking better. And so it just goes to show you, like, there's way- There's so much individualized- it, it, There's so much of an individual variance with nutrition. It's insane. What works well for one person- It's like a, you have, it's like a fingerprint, especially when you, when you look at the, your gut flora and then the emotional connections to food, yeah. and you, you add all that shit up. It's like- you can you can say general you can give people general advice and part of that general advice is yeah you got to take in less calories than you burn you're not going to lose weight that's actually a law of physics I mean if you could get around that I mean we need to study that because <laughs> you've just discovered like a way to create something out of nothing well people get confused because people will say things like well I I don't believe in calories in calories out because I I, I was in a calorie deficit and I didn't lose weight 
No, 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 no. You weren't in a deficit. <laughs> you, by definition, you were not in a deficit. Right. I think what confuses people is they'll go online and, and put into a calculator right. what their deficit should be. And they'll do that and not lose weight. Well, I'm sorry. That means it wasn't your deficit. Mm-hmm. Okay. So basically, we know what makes up calories in versus calories out, right? So we know calories in is literally just the energy we eat that goes in. Pretty simple. What is more complex is the calories outside of the Very equation. complex. So you have, while the concept is very simple, what makes up calories out is a very complicated and we don't fully understand and it's individual too by the way oh yeah so like your rmr for most people is the bulk of their is about 60 percent of your your daily total energy expenditure then you have neat which is very modifiable um up to it seems like around 500 calories a day possibly even more oh more than that um i think probably more than that in extreme circumstances um, and that's non-exercise adaptive thermogenesis. So basically like fidgeting and- Just your uh, movement that's non- working out. Walking. Cleaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Non- non-voluntary Whatever. movement. Mm. Non-purposeful, non-voluntary movement. And then um, your obviously your exercise and then your thermic effect of food. Most of those are modifiable. Um, you know, we all know somebody who does two hours on the treadmill every day and can't seem to lose weight, even though they say, well, I burned 2000 calories. Well, actually, no, you didn't. Your body, look at marathon runners, some marathon runners. I've seen marathon runners who eat 2000 calories a day. Let's talk about this. And maintain their weight. Let's talk about Because they're so efficient. Yeah. Metabolic adaptation is fascinating. They did a study on modern hunter gatherers, the Hadza tribe. It's H-A-D-Z-A. And you can look this up and we'll make sure to put it in the show notes. But they- through, and they used very sophisticated means to test how many calories these people were burning on a regular basis. And there were several tests that they compiled and, and, and generated an average from. Now, they went into, the researchers went into the study fully expecting that these modern hunter-gatherers burned way more calories than the average Westerner. They thought for sure they're going to be burning like two or three times as many calories because, and this is a, this is a it's totally plausible, this hypothesis is totally understandable. You're looking at these people. You see how active they are, how much they walk, how much they run, they hunt, they cook, versus the average Westerner who basically sits down all day long. What they found was far more fascinating. They, they burned just a little bit more calories than the average Westerner. Now, that sounds crazy because of all the movement that they're doing, but it yep. makes fucking sense from an evolutionary standpoint. Of course it does. Of course your body's going to become efficient because food is scarce in real life. And what yeah. I mean by real life is without the modern you know uh, advancements of there it is right there very very fascinating they didn't burn that many more calories metabolic adaptation is insane and I, that's this is perfect way to segue into reverse dieting because i know early on you got a lot of heat for talking yeah. about this and you might still be getting heat oh yeah so let's talk about this for a second what I'm, is reverse I'm, dieting I'm lyle mcdonald's favorite person in the world <laughs> yeah what is, hi lyle <laughs> what does what is reverse dieting and and what is ha- like how does it work or at least what are the results of of reverse dieting so you know me i'm not very good at being concise but i'll do my best to be concise so basically what i had started to notice with people was that especially you know i worked with a lot of competitors but I see this with the average person too. I started to realize how impo- how big this was for the average person. <laughs> Competitors are just an extreme version of it. Right, correct. I had, especially women, because uh, they tend to just diet more than men. People don't realize dieting will fuck you up. Like, yeah. like go read some of McLean's work. Like, there's actually some really new uh, research on the actual adipose cell that I'll get into later that's fucking fascinating. Mm. Um what I noticed was people were like, they'd come to me and they were maintaining their weight on extremely low levels of calories, mm-hmm. you know, stuff that didn't even make sense. And at first I was kind of like, all right, well, they're just underreporting, you know, and I would have them track and really track, you know, and some of them were, but a lot of them weren't. And so now, some this, of these people did are- Did this shatter your paradigm at the moment? Because you understood nutrition, you understood yeah. chemistry. Were you like, this is bull- well, this is I, crazy. I had never dealt with that myself, right? Like, Well, we talk about this all the time. It was the same experience for us. I, I mean, know. we all thought they were lying to us. Yeah. So I was like, my clients have got to be lying to me. Yeah, There's no way stuff you're in. 300 pounds and you're telling me you eat two salads a day. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and, you, and you, you, you get into it. And even if there is underreporting, it still can't possibly explain right. mm-hmm. some of the stuff you're seeing. And- yeah, it's just, well, look at, let's just go with this. Let's look at bariatric surgery. Have you ever seen somebody who had bariatric surgery who got really lean? Mm-mm. You don't see it. They lose weight, mostly. Some some actually don't. But they lose weight. 
but they stop at a certain point, even though they're consuming 900, 1,000 calories a day. How? Well, while getting lean may seem great for looking good at the beach, it fucking sucks for survival. Your body does not give a shit about you being able to have a six pack. What it gives a damn about is you staying alive long enough to pass on your genetic material. Hopefully numerous times based mm. on evolution. <laughs> but it, it being lean, if you're lean when famine hits, you're going to be the first motherfucker to go, right? So you're, there's, I mean, you guys have probably talked about the thrifty gene hypothesis, mm-hmm. hypothesis, right? But more so than that, what I had noticed was that people who tended to diet in a certain cyclical kind of di- diet cycle were in way worse shape in terms of metabolically than other people. So people who tended to uh, crash diet or fad diet or just spend a lot of their time in a, in a, in a calculated deficit uh, without giving themselves enough time to recover metabolically, those were the people who did really bad. And the people who did the worst were people who basically would diet for long periods of time and then some event would hit, whether it be a show, a wedding, whatever. They're always dieting for something. And they would basically binge eat their way back up to or their previous weight or more, mm-hmm. right? And these people would be very overweight or more than what they'd want and would ha- be have like incredibly low intakes for their weight and lean body mass. It just wouldn't make sense. Now, the heat I got was, you know, uh, basically mostly from Law McDonald, who just kept pointing out, who just kept, you know, harping on the fact that, well, the studies show that metabolic adaptation is only 15% that your BMR is only modifiable through 15%, which I think is an average is probably right. But if an average is 15%, then that means there's outliers who are 35 and 40%. Sure. My friend, Chris Foss, he did a uh, uh, case study on himself. On natu- he was the first natural bodybuilding contest prep case study. Chris is a big dude. Chris is probably like 85 kilos of lean body mass. For a natural guy, that's a, that's a big dude. And he did a contest prep 24 weeks. I prepped him for it. And, uh, you know, so even this is doing things like very controlled, not crash dieting, whatnot. He started out, his BMR was 2,400 calories a day. You know what his BMR was by the end? 1,285. Yeah. Wow. 1,285. Now, he's probably an outlier. He was very, I noticed he was, his metabolism adapted very quickly. So well, you know, was, this that goes to the point what Ben Pakulski talked to us about, like the benefits of guys that are bodybuilders his yeah, size. You, this, we, we made a comment on the, a, an interview we did with him about like how, you know, in order to be like this, you know, Olympian bodybuilder, you've got to have, have these freak genetics, the steroids, the hard training, all of it together. And then Sal brought up the point, the ability to eat tons mm-hmm. of food in order to support all that muscle. And Ben actually corrected him. He goes, no, it's it's not that. It's actually the other way. It's that you have the ability to hang on to that much muscle with as little calories as you need possible. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it made sense because I'm like, how can you eat 10,000 calories a day? Yeah. And he's like, no, no, no. It's being able to eat like 4,000 calories a day and still get this big. Yeah, and, and, and efficiency, mm-hmm. right? So – you know, you looked at uh, Chris when you when you took out like um, the difference in movement and the difference in uh, his his lean body mass and whatnot. It was like a thirty three percent metabolic adaptation. Which so metabolic adaptation is basically long time ago. And one of the things that my PhD advisor Don Lehman, brilliant man, was actually wrong about though was he told he told me he thought that the decrease in metabolic rate from dieting and from age was simply due to loss of lean body mass. Mm. And I disagreed with him at the time, but there just wasn't much research on it. Now we know the research, and it says that yes, your your metabolic rate does slow down from from just overall ma- you know dropping mass, but metabolic adaptation it's always more than you would predict by that. Mm-hmm. And metabolic adaptation is that difference. How much more do you does your metabolism slow down? Than predicted by your loss of of lean body mass and body fat. There's so it's there's so much more to it that we that we currently understand. Uh, lean body mass plays a role and it plays a, a large role, but there's a lot of unknowns and it's fascinating because look here's the deal. This is why I don't like studies that sh- that show you know oh 15 percent is really the where metabolic adaptation can happen and that's that's what it looks like. Here's the deal. Like we know. We know how efficient the body can get. We we have studies on POWs who survive yeah. on a hundred to two hundred to three hundred calories a fucking day for for decades. Yep. You know. Now that's an extreme case, but the body can really become efficient. I also know through experience, and here's the deal. This is this is why 
This is where well, I look think at anorexics. So, look at yes, anorexics yes. who survive for long periods of yep. time with very little. Yeah, calories. Yeah, five hundred calories a day. And here's here's my my beef with scientists. I love I love science. I love information. I love knowledge, but knowledge without experience uh, is is not. It, it, it's just ideas and information. Mm. Wisdom comes from combining the two. And many times, experience will show you things that we don't necessarily have the information to explain. But yeah. I can tell you, mm-hmm. as a trainer, having worked with thousands of clients and having been done this for 20 years, that I, I've took it. Look, I had a client. I told this show. So I was, we were on Tom Bilyeu's Health Impact, which is his channel on YouTube. Tom and I told me. And I told this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, and I told, I told the story. And uh, I got a little bit of heat from it from people because I knew people would freak out over it. But I had a client who was running 20 miles a week barely doing any resistance training. She was consuming like 16 or 1700 calories a day, which if you consider all her activity was not that much. No. And I changed her workout, changed her approach. And by the end of it, we, she was consuming almost 2,400 calories a day. Mm. She was still working out a lot, but she wasn't running nearly as much. And she was leaner. And it's, yep. it's, you can do that. You can do that with your body, but it's, it's, yeah, let's yeah, talk about anecdote a little bit. Yeah, yeah so, I was gonna, I was gonna yeah, say yeah, let's, let's get into that because I think, uh, and I know I've seen a little bit of like, you know, the the attention and the trolling a bit on the pseudoscience that's out there and, and yeah. pervades, uh, you know, the the industry. But you know, is there any value to that? You know, from a well, scientific perspective. I mean, so like getting back, I never answered your question about yeah, yeah. reverse dieting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Went no, we'll down go, the rabbit we'll hole. We'll get there. Uh, you know, and reverse dieting is just basically slow controlled additions of calories to raise metabolic rate while hopefully minimizing body fat gain. But I have seen and observed, I mean, I had one girl who went from, I'm not kidding you, 120, I remember carb and fat intakes. I don't remember calories necessarily. But I had one girl who went from 120 grams of carbs per day and like 45 grams of fat to over 300 grams of carbohydrate intake uh, and 70 grams of fat and lost 10 pounds during that time period. Yep. And okay, yes, maybe she changed her resistance training. Maybe she, it does, that does not make up for the amount the calories that were added in. Uh, Holly, Holly was at, she just started a reverse dieting. She's I think eleven weeks in. She started at fourteen hundred calories. She's up to over two thousand. Has not gained any weight, and her training has actually been less. So she actually she's doing more powerlifting based training. She went from more bodybuilding style with supersets, you know, a lot of volume to more intensity, less volume, uh, longer rest between sets, and almost no cardio. Which, by the way, do you advise? I advise that when I reverse diet somebody, I actually like to switch them from because typically people are training in the more hypertrophy based training and supersetting, and that that's what they've done that they or high circuit type training to lose weight. So switching them over to a strength based program while I'm also adding calories tends to do really well. I think I think this is that psychological component, especially for women. If you can shift their focus from, oh my God, I'm fat, I want to lose this weight, to holy shit, this is cool about how strong I'm getting, right? Even though they're not losing weight, or maybe gaining a little bit, they become more and more okay with it because they see the, the, the positives of sure. strength training and getting stronger, right? And that becomes addictive as opposed to mm-hmm. trying to lose weight, right? So I think that's that psychological component. And yes, that can be really helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you're going to sit there and tell me that like Holly gained five kilos of lean body mass and that explains the difference in her. No, it doesn't like, and she's not moving more. Like I'm with her every day. We're literally sitting in the office every day. Like our activity is the same, you know, and maybe she does fidget more and I don't see it, but at the end of the day, who gives a damn if it's fidgeting or if it's an increase in BMR, because it's still enables her to eat more food. So when she goes to diet back down next time, easy. It's going to be much easier because mm-hmm. she's only, you know, four kilos above stage weight. That's going to be a lot easier to lose than when she was maintaining her body weight on 1,600 calories a day yeah. trying to crush herself to lose that weight. What I, what I found is the, the, the perfect combination because I do think that a structured, you know, targeted uh, resistance training routine should be combined with reverse dieting because not necessarily because you need the extra lean body mass. Like you said, that doesn't account for all of it. But I do think... Helps. When, when you're asking your body to adapt in a way that makes it, quote unquote, less efficient with calories and you start feeding it more, you're going to get a better effect than if you don't do that and you just feed someone more, in which case you may actually get someone just gaining you know, more body fat. And, and resistance training does that because when you're asking the body to get stronger, 
It's not worried about efficiency. It needs thicker muscle fibers to produce more force. When you're asking your body to become to gain more stamina and endurance, you're asking for it to become you don't need big big muscle fibers for that. You don't need big muscle a lot of force for endurance. You just need muscle fibers that can contract repeatedly, you know, for long periods of time. But you also are asking your body to become more efficient because let's be honest, an hour of resistance training for strength burns what? A third of the calories of an hour of cardio. And your body's going to try and become efficient with the because you're burning so many calories yep. manually, and so that's what ends up happening. Now, I've also heard this, and I and I agree with it. Does that mean it's healthy? Like, in other words, is it healthy mm. to get your body to want to burn more calories? I don't think so. Uh, now, I'm not I'm not using context here yet, so I'm going to get there in just a second. But I know what you're getting at. Yeah, I don't think it's healthier because obviously more potential for inflammation, you're processing more food, there's more things happening in the body, lower calories over long periods of time seems to be better for longevity and all that stuff. But in the context of modern life, you want a fast metabolism. Well, so two things, a lot of stuff to unwrap there. But, you know, the calorie restriction component of longevity doesn't seem to be as clear cut as we made it out to be. Um, Seems to be really beneficial in uh, animals. The human data just doesn't support it yet. Now, it's hard to get really super controlled studies. And I yeah, especially that. now. Who the hell is he? I, I acknowledge that. <laughs> Who the hell's under eating but, these days? You know, keep in mind, <laughs> two things I want to point out. So going back, uh, Greg Knuckles. You guys know Greg Knuckles? I know the name. Yeah, I know the name. Follow him okay. and have him on your podcast at some point. He's fabulous. Okay. Um, he sa- said something that I thought was really, really important. He said, science is science, bros. So there's two mistakes that people tend to make. Sciencey science bros tend to make the mistake that because something reported in a study is an average, right? That's what's reported. They assume that the average will work for everyone. Bros tend to make the mistake of this one thing worked for me, so it will work for everyone. Mm. The reality is, is that we should probably start with the average is the most high probability to work for most people. But we also need to acknowledge that something will likely work better for somebody else. I mean, there's studies in resistance training where they show people do 12 weeks of resistance training and don't get stronger, Yeah, who are untrained, right? Mm-hmm. Outliers, right? There's also studies that show people never pick up a barbell and in 12 weeks, they're squatting 400 pounds, yeah. right? So there's hyper responders for, for everything. Um, the other thing is with the you know calories and long, longevity and, and health, you have to, I think we need to keep in mind that it's like, Think about your time, right? So we have to acknowledge that if we want to do this podcast, we're taking time away from something else we could be doing. Spending time with family, um, going out doing something fun, although this is fun, (laughs) Um, you know, bowling, whatever, right? So we're, we're taking some time, we're putting it towards this. It's taking away from something else. If something is, I think we kind of have this idea that we're going to be able to find this diet that's great for preventing cancer, great for preventing cardiovascular disease, uh, good for gut health. All this. The fact of the matter is, if you're on something that maybe prevents cardiovascular disease, it might not be the best thing for cancer. People don't want to acknowledge that, but it probably is true. If you want something with the optimal body composition, it might not be the best thing for longevity. Mm-hmm. If you want something for the best gut health, it might not be the best thing for our, you know, cardiovascular oh, disease. For sure, the so, best thing for longevity is not the best thing for performance. For right. For sure. So... So we need to have an honest conversation and acknowledge that. And what, what is your goal, right? So these people that most of these dudes who like, I've had this debate on Twitter recently who are promoting like a low carb lifestyle, like, well, you just talk about macros. You don't talk about overall health. I'm like, all right, well, fine. Let's talk about overall health and let's talk about how you're eating. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because there's evidence that keto ain't the best for longevity either, bro. You know? So it's what are we talking about? We're we talking about body composition. We're talking about performance. We're talking about longevity. Because I can tell you what's best for longevity lift weights modestly, walk, do some cardiovascular exercise, do some, do some calorie restriction, and stay at about 15 to 20% body fat. Or, well, 15% body fat if you're a male, 20, 25 if you're a female. People want to be ripped. They don't want to yeah. hear that, right? Yeah. So, you know, to make a metabolism inefficient, right? That means you're having to cycle through more energy metabolism. Mm-hmm. That the idea of creating more ATP, 
more dissipation of energy, that creates more redox species, more, you know, more, more inflammation, that sort of thing. Now, I will say, I think that it's a big difference between giving a very controlled dose of a stressor and controlled overfeeding versus somebody who's just sitting on the couch banging down potato chips. Oh, huge difference, right? of course. I think that most people, if you're doing resistance training and you're just controlling your diet, right? Does that make sense? Even if it's overfeeding, but controlling your diet, you still be a pretty darn healthy person and probably live to a ripe old age, barring, you know, random shit. Sure. Well, at what right? point what point are we overworking the digestive system? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Because I, I think that has to be a point that's made too. Because every other system we can overtrain, overwork, outdo, overstress. Like, you, know, you know what I think? I think that the, there is some population studies that suggest that calorie restriction, long periods of time, contributes to longevity. But there's a lot of stuff in there to unpack. There's a lot of factors. But I what think I would part- say is what about, what about you know, the fact that – so the idea with making our metabolisms more inefficient – is so that at some point we can calorie restrict and it's more effective, right, for body composition. So what I'm not saying is always overfeed. Sure. I'm saying, you know, because dieting, I've seen people diet their way into fatness. All right. So is oh, that we, really healthier? No, right? not at all. So I, we see. I, I've, I I know exactly what you're talking about. I saw that all the time. But what I was going to say is, I think where we see the health benefits of restricting calories may not come necessarily from restricting calories, although there are some benefits to that as well. I think it comes from how well, the body responds. Uh, we're just the absence of food, like fasting. Now you want to look at the science on fasting and what that's saying in terms of longevity, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, all that stuff. That's fucking fascinating. When you want to look at, you know, being able to switch in and out of ketosis very easily and how ketosis has some medical applications, humans probably went into ketosis on and off all the time. You go without food for 24 hours, 48 hours, which probably happened quite a bit. Uh, you're in ketosis, right? Some people go into ketosis when they go to sleep. Just, 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 just happens. And that's where I think some of the health benefits come from. Some of the detriments of overfeeding ourselves, too many calories, wrong foods, all that stuff. I get all that. But I think the other side of it is we eat all the time, all the time. Like no, most people who grow up in these modern, developed Western societies, never went without food for longer than 18 hours. And what we're learning now is that maybe Dr. Dr. Walter Longo says it's, a, it's another operating system that's ne- it's necessary that we tap into where we go without food sometimes. I do it semi-regularly and I, see, I do enjoy lots of benefits from it, but I think that may be where the benefit where they see the longevity effects of restricted calories is the fact that they, people go without because we just feed ourselves all the fucking time. Think about that. Yeah, I, th- I think controlled periods of underfeeding are very important. You know, um, I think you get a lot of the 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 benefits from that. I think th- why I say you got to be careful is because you know while I was doing research for my book that I wrote, mm-hmm. you guys uh, we talked about in the last yes, podcast, yes, the contest prep book. Um, it was basically I just did a lot of research on dieting and the dieting studies that are out there, and actually. Uh, I'll probably do an updated version of the book because um, I just found some new shit like really recently out of uh, University of Denver. The structural changes and the metabolic changes in the adipose tissue from dieting is fucking fascinating. So like absolutely how? fascinating. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get. I'll, I'm gonna go down the rabbit yeah, hole with yeah, you yeah. guys. So uh, we used to think about adipose tissue as it was just basically like a sponge, right? You ate too much, it soaked it up. You didn't eat enough, it spat it out, and it was just an energy reserve. Mm -hmm. Adipose tissue is an organ. It fits every definition of an organ. It secretes its own hormones. It integrates hormonal signals. It talks to other organs. It talks to the brain a lot and the gut. Um, They found it it interacts with the immune system through the central nervous system. Hell yeah. I mean, adipokines are cytokines secreted by adipose tissue, Mm -hmm. right? So what they found is that dieting places a stress on the extracellular matrix of adipose tissue, which by the way is not uniform throughout the body. Different depots of av- of adipose have differential effects on things like metabolic rate and hunger. Okay. So for example, when you uh when you're coming back out of a diet, regaining body fat, like recovering from a diet, say say in the case of a contest prep competitor, a lot of people, and I don't know if you guys can speak to this, have noticed that they gain fat differentially from how they stored it before. Mm-hmm. You tend to regain it in your abdominal, in your trunk. 
you also tend to recover your lean body mass slowest in your trunk. The, uh, the trunk abdominal fat seems to have a less beneficial effect on metabolic rate um, and the trunk lean body mass has more has less or has more impact on metabolic rate than extremity lean body mass. So you tend to regain lean body mass post diet uh, in your extremities versus your trunk. And they find that you don't really recover your metabolic rate until you regain that in your trunk. In, in some studies, hmm. um, I did not know that. Yeah, very very interesting. So so that stress on the extracellular matrix when you diet combined with the changes in your thyroid hormone. And also the effects of leptin. So we think about leptin. You guys, I'm sure, are very familiar with leptin. Controlled, we think, by the fat cell size. So as you diet, fat cell shrinks, secretes more leptin, makes you hungry, want to overfeed, get back up to your body fat set point. What's interesting is actually it's also sensitive to the flux of energy across the cell. So if you overfeed, even for a short period of time, you'll increase leptin. Now, it's usually not high enough and, and, and of enough duration to cause a meaningful impact on long-term metabolic rate. But in that phase of transition between ending a diet and beginning recovery or maintenance, your leptin levels and your adipose tissue is more responsive to short-term changes in energy intake than it is the long-term cell size of the adipose tissue. So if you rapidly overfeed, your body will actually respond more sensitively to that compared to if you, so for example, if you uh, binge ate 5,000 calories at the end of a diet compared to being, haven't been dieting, you know, just kind of maintenance or just overfeeding. Just 300 every now yeah, and then yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you're, 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 and you overfeed by 5,000 calories, you're much, much, much more likely to store excessive body fat uh, when after you've been dieting not only that, you are likely to trigger the differentiation of the pre-adipocyte into a fully formed adipocyte. So why is that important? Well, it makes it harder to get, to get lean. Exactly, to because now you're increasing your long-term fat storage depot potential. We used to think that pre-adipocyte differentiation into adipocytes only happened if you ate so much and you became so grossly obese that your body could no longer store it. Right, and you had to make new adipocytes. We're now finding that that's not the case. It's also a flux question. So if you've been very restricted for a while, and you rapidly overfeed, you can increase your fat cell number. Hmm. So I did I, not I, know that. I, and this must be new because it, it used is to, new. Wow, because it used to be like puberty, you know, third trimester pregnancy, and that's kind of. Yeah. So we also used to think that adipose tissue just sat there, right? It was just the set cell number. Now we know that new adipocytes are being formed constantly and being a limb and old adipocytes being turned over constantly. Okay. So it's a, now that re, that is very tightly regulated. It's almost always a net of zero, but when you restrict and you do it for you know, a long period of time or more aggressive, you start to tip the scale when you, when you start to f add calories back in, if you do it too aggressively, you tip the scale towards formation of pre adipocyte mm -hmm. uh, differentiation but also, but still maintaining or lowering your elimination of old fat cells. Wow. So, so what's your, what's your idea or your theory then on, on that point then with like carb cycling of doing it like kind of a short, in a short term like that? It, it, See that the question is, we don't really know like how long does this take to trigger, mm -hmm, right? right. Can, can you do it in one meal or does it take 10 days or, or what is it? Right. We don't, we don't really know. What we do know is that uh, there was a rat study done by the same researcher. That's absolutely fascinating. So they took rats that were 700 grams and they dieted them down to 600 grams. So they lost a seventh of their body weight, which is reasonable for a lot of humans, mm -hmm. right? You're talking about somebody go who's 210 pounds going down to 180. Right. They then, so they then, they, they measured the fat cell, the size of their fat cells and the fat cell number. Uh, the fat cell number was pretty much the same at the beginning as it was at the end. I think they started out with 37 million, they ended with 39 million. Now, there is a lot of... Uh, I don't want people to think that's a meaningful difference. It wasn't statistically. You mean the other way around, right? Thirty-nine to thirty-seven. Not no, 30. no, they started with thirty-seven, ended with thirty-nine. It's still, but not, but it's not statistically different. No, because they okay? have to average them anyway. Because it's not a perfect measurement. Okay. Right. Um. So could they have gained? A, who knows? But the the size had shrunk quite a bit, right? Like expected. Then they just ad libitum fed them. They gave them however much food they wanted. 
within within early relapse, their fat cell size had actually shrunk a little bit more. So they'd only regained 20 grams back. They'd only regained a fifth of what they lost. Their fat cell number increased by 50%. They had 55 million fat cells. Wow. Hmm. So, now, you know, you know what? It, if, you, if you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes perfect sense. Of course if, it does. If you're constantly cycling through these high periods of... And you finally get your hunt. You finally get food. Your, your body's getting better at surviving longer without, Damn right. without food. It's just adapting. So think about... Um, so not only if you were... Does your body want to become more efficient if you were in a famine or low calorie and not burn so much, it also would want to be able to perfectly capture the energy when you finally came across it, right? You don't want to, so you come across a, a I don't know, a kill, right? Mm -hmm. As a hunter gatherer, that meat is not going to keep for very long. So you're going to, you and your tribe are going to eat it. You're going to eat all of it, right? Like, and you need to be able to store that energy. You don't want to dissipate it as heat. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have a the thermogenesis. You want to, you want to store as much of it as you can. So why would you make new fat cells? Well, you can, I think, this is me going out on a limb. I think there's probably a limit to how much energy flux can go across each individual cell per unit time, right? And so the pre-adipocytes form, they differentiate as a way to, in the short term, be able capture to accommodate that energy. Yeah, to capture right? more of it. Now, the problem is with people who are trying to get lean when they do this, where they're, they're basically, they diet for something and they binge eat at the end of it, which mm -hmm. is a lot of people, by the way. Yeah. Perfect storm you're creating a really bad mm. situation, right? Because now you've got these extra... And we don't know if you can get rid of them. So, People ask me all that all the time. We don't know. Well, I was just going to say, because whenever we observe an, ad an adaptive phenomenon in the body, oftentimes, I can't think of a time when this doesn't happen, you, the adaptive response can go in the opposite as well. Have they observed people being able to kill off fat cells or reduce so, that? So, interestingly, No. Uh, even with like things like lipo, what tends to happen is if you have lipo and you're taking fat cells out, it just stimulates your bone marrow to produce more of it. Mm -hmm. so I, I think I believe they come from bone marrow. I believe that's where they start. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll finish the, the thoughts on the yeah. study because you guys will find this fascinating. It still fits with body fat set point and cell size is controlling kind of long term leptin secretion and, and body weight. Um, so they, they continue to let the rats overfeed. They hit their pre diet weight of 700 grams. But interestingly, every individual fat cell was still smaller, right? Because now there's more overall fat cells, right? So each individual cell, as they get back to their previous body fat percentage, is going to be smaller. And since leptin secretion is controlled for by the size of the individual fat cell, their bodies, the, the hypothesis is, still perceive that they were in a deficit, because the size of the fat Holy cell was shit. still reduced. So even though the, 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 the they same did weight not, as before. Exactly. They did not stop regaining weight until 740 grams. Wow. Hmm. Which, was the, which was when their individual fat cells got up to 102 microns. Exactly what they were before they started. Wow, so it's controlling. Am I blowing your minds yet? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, so it's controlling for size of, of fat cells, not number of fat cells. Correct. So you're fucked. You basically so, screw your... Oh, you know, it's funny. We've observed this phenomenon forever in fitness where people diet, binge, diet, binge, diet, binge. Each cycle... It gets harder every single gets time. Gets harder more, every yeah. single time. More difficult each time. And then, of course, the people blame it on age and stuff like that. And it's like... Right. It's not that. No, it's not no. that. It's it's. Fucking I think yourself. these adipose tissue adaptations are just as important, if not more important, than the actual effects on metabolic rate because it's affecting your long-term potential for fat storage. Have you seen hmm. the studies on how cold affects fat and it turns it into... Uh, it, it activates fat. the immune system to get it to become more thermogenic and become... Interesting. Turn into brown fat. Yeah. There's some there, there's some fascinating studies on that as well, but I think you're 100 percent right. I think the adaptation. Of course I am. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kidding everybody yeah, out yeah. there. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> you were real likable for a second. Like, I was. <laughs> we were doing so well. I want I you had to blow. I it. want to get back to Holly though, because I know there's got to be a lot of women that are listening right now that are probably eating a thousand to fifteen hundred calories and wish they could be eating two thousand calories. Could you kind of step us through like what does that look like week over week, and do yeah. are there certain types of foods that you choose to add in? Like, yeah. So, so there are a few things in terms of when you're, I think what people could really gain a lot from is ending their diets better. Okay. So, 
hopefully we're dieting with an endpoint, right? Like in terms of like, we don't want to be calorically restricted forever. Mm -hmm. That would suck ass, right? Because, okay, longevity, whatever, but also, hey, quality of life, right? right? Of course. Like, so first thing is have a plan when you're done. Don't be the plan. Be like, okay, I'm ending my diet. Then I'm going on a cruise on an all you can eat vacation, right? Like, yeah, that's going to be the recipe for exactly what we're talking about. All right. (laughs) So I tell people in that situation, hey, get ready early, then reverse diet into your vacation. Right. So you hopefully you maintain that leanness. Brilliant. And now your metabolic rate is faster. So, hey, you have that three. Holly, one of the things she comments on most now is she's like, oh, my God, I can kind of fuck up in the morning and have a little more calories than I would normally. And it doesn't mean I'm fasting for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, like I can still have dinner. And she, what she loves more than anything is just the flexibility in mm-hmm. her lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Sure. Even if you flexible diet, 1,400 calories is not something that's flexible. No, right? it's not. No, no. You, have, you have half piece of cheesecake, done. You're right. You know what I mean? So um, that's one of the things she's commented on. So one, have a plan. Two, a higher protein diet, possibly because the lean body mass regenerative effects, as well as the um, satiety effects. Now, when you say high, explain high to you. Uh, you know, two to two. people hear high in the bodybuilding yeah, world, they, go, they get two and a half grams, three grams. Per pound, yeah. yeah. So if you want to go by, you know, you know, us scientists speak in grams per kilo of lean body mass, but if you want the general bro rule, uh, 0.8 to 1.2 grams of protein per pound of body weight is going to, is going to be, yeah, one, to one, get you one to one's an easy one yeah. to remember. One, one, you know, the in old relatively rule of, need, in relatively lean individuals, you don't want to, yeah, know, if you're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why we usually use lean body mass. We say two to three grams per kilo of lean body mass, lean body mass is, yeah. is, is probably a better metric. And that's what we use. And we have our own, like, I don't want to call it an algorithm, but like a, a, a sheet of calculations we work up for clients and help us come to mm-hmm. these these mm-hmm. measurements. Uh, Holly's way more detailed with that than I am. But um, so a high protein diet um, and then slow controlled additions of calories so that your body, your body, it's you're giving yourself some recovery. You're going to feel better. And I mean, you can even people think, oh, my God, what do I? Add five grams of carbs a week. No, no. Like you finish a diet, you can probably increase your intake by 50% and you're not going to hit that threshold for causing formation of, of new fat cells. I'm just guessing. Mm-hmm. Okay. But like at the end of her diet, she wanted to be very conservative because she likes being lean. You know, she, she actually, she tells me she abhors getting her period. She hates it. Mm-hmm. She's like, I don't know how women deal with this. I, I, I don't want it. You know, <laughs> so, so she wants to stay lean enough to avoid that. Mm-hmm. Um, and also just she likes being lean. She's been an athlete her whole life. She just likes being lean. Who doesn't? But uh, so we were very conservative. So we started out, I think she ended her diet like 130 grams of carbs a day and like uh, 40 grams of fat, something like that. And I think she started at like 45 grams of fat and 150 grams of carbs. She was very, very conservative um, and just slow controlled additions. And what's funny is people will go, well, adding 10 grams of carbs in a week, like that's a sneeze. Like even food labels aren't that accurate. How's mm-hmm. it? You have to think about it as from week to week, there may not be much difference. But if you add 10 grams of carbs and two grams of fat every week for 10 weeks, that's a significant difference. That's what I was just going to ask. So you're you're going really slow. You're adding 10 With, grams here, t- you know, five grams Well, it's there. all relative. It's relative to her size. We're talking about somebody sure. who's eating Correct. 1,400 calories. Correct. If you're if we're trying to reverse somebody Is there a percent that you... you and it, yeah, it's so, got to so, depend on the person so too. So it's usually like, I'm like, I usually increase carbs and fats. I usually hold protein steady as long as it's already sufficient. Mm-hmm. You know, most people are already eating enough protein who are listening to this podcast, sure. right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, we're not having to convince anybody. We're not trying to convince grandma that a high protein diet is good. Like, you know, most people listening here know this, um, but like carbs and fats, like increasing like two to to eight percent per week. You know, that's kind of like the, the okay. area we live in. But usually, like at the end of the diet, I like somebody to do kind of an initial calorie boost just to help get them to something that's. Like Holly's a freak. You know, most people would not be able to end a diet and then adhere to basically diet numbers for the next six weeks while they're coming out of that deficit, mm-hmm. right? So. You know, I tell people you have to have an honest conversation about uh, what your goals are and what you're willing to accommodate for. If you are willing to accept some fat gain, then you can be a little bit more aggressive with your calorie increases. You know, what we're basically looking for is not you know binge eating, right? Right. You know, post diet. I used to pick like a, for female and for females, I'd have you know 30, 30 calories or so, and that's I was just go by calories, and then mm-hmm. I'd make 
you know, low glycemic carbohydrates is what I'd introduce. Do you have specific foods that you choose? And do you have, is there certain things for men or women that you do differently? Because you guys are still coaching a lot of clients, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, We probably have about 100 clients between the two of us. Oh, shit. Okay. Um, Do you deal with this a lot? I mean, are you guys having to reverse a lot of people? Oh, yeah. Especially with her because, you know, women automatically just gravitate to her because they, women feel comfortable being coached by a woman. Uh, I have a lot of female clients too, but you know, seeing her, her reverse diet series on YouTube has actually gotten her so many clients just from, it's so funny. You can show data, you can show hypothesis, we can talk about it, but when they see it, of course, when they see a girl doing it, they go like me talking about it as a dude, they go, okay, well he doesn't understand, even though I do, (laughs) I, I know the physiology, but them seeing a woman do it, they go, Okay, I want her to coach me, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we do, we have a lot of people who are reverse dieting. I think because it's something we're passionate about, we talk about it a lot. We just tend to attract those kind of clients, which is actually probably one of the toughest demographics for clients, to be honest. Um, for sure. Well, because they're coming to you with a, a lot, lot of, of them are, issues. Are, are broken, dude. Well, yeah, go uh, back to the psychological piece. Why well, I, I think psychological piece is so this not like some some. I had one girl. She did everything I asked of her. Like, and she has gained 25 pounds in a conservative reverse diet. Her metabolism is just so fucking slow. Mm -hmm. You know, from, I mean, she basically told me that her last coach had her, that she was between 700 to 1,000 calories a day for like years. Oh, boy. You know. And you know, we got to talk about this. She's just now gotten over 2,000 calories. I was just going to say, this is an important thing to understand because I've worked with clients too. And and you tell them sometimes you're going to have to, if you want to get out of this whole, Sometimes you have to gain weight. It might get worse before it gets better. Do you guys actually? So what do you, what do you say to them? Because twenty five pound weight gain to somebody who's damaged yeah, they metabolism. Just go, yeah. I, I what I tell them is, staying in the same cycle is going to keep producing what you've gotten. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if you want something different, you have to make a different decision. And yeah, the idea of maybe you having to gain weight. I mean, a lot of women come to me and they're like, "I'm not willing to accommodate any weight gain." I said, "Well, then maybe you're." you're you know, You're not ready. You you know like sometimes to 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 undo years of telling your body there is famine and doing what uh, the researcher McLean calls he called this activating your body's self defense systems, which are numerous, redundant, and powerful. Okay, so telling your body this, it may take years to fix. Now most clients don't give you that kind of time. Because no. while I'm over here saying, yeah, you may have to gain some weight. It may take a few years to fix. There's fucking some other asshole over there saying, just do keto, bro. Keto yeah. will fix all the problems. Yeah. Or, or this thing is going to fix all the problems. Plus you're dealing with an, with somebody who's probably got insecurities with their body. Of course. And, and you got to tell them you're going to gain weight for two years. Possibly. Yeah. yeah, maybe. You know, that's that's a tough one. I have a few other theories in in, in regards to this. We had, uh, we had someone on the podcast recently who said that perhaps the central nervous system is remembering... Some of these. Oh, I absolutely think there's diet memory. Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And, and and when you look at it that way, when you look at the 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 hum, the, the, the whole organism and the central nervous system being involved and in, in remembering diets as past famines and all that stuff, for me, the in my experience, I've had a lot of success when I work with people like this where they have damaged metabolism. And not only do I slowly reverse them out of it, not only do I make the focus you know, strength training type, resistance training, straight sets, long rest, that type of stuff, because that seems to help. And I also reduce cardio because I see how cardio tends to keep the metabolism efficient. Oh, yeah. The other thing I try to do is I try to incorporate like a stress management plan and incorporate things like yep. yin yoga, meditation, because all those stresses on the body, especially in that hypersensitive state, in my in my opinion – seem to trigger those self-defense Well, not to mention mechanisms. most of those people that fall well, in the trap are the type A type personalities yeah, yeah. that are like the, the get after it, right? They get after it at work, they get after it in their family life, their relationships, and they crush it in the gym. It's like Well, stress is a, is a memory trigger for a lot of tissues in the body. Like even like uh, me, I'll get lower back pain when I get stressed out. Oh, for sure. Even though there might not be anything structurally wrong, I will get it, mm-hmm. you know? Even though I'm uh, six months, you're I've sounding very it. esoteric right now. I was going to say that's a little woo woo right there. You know, I'm doing some body work. Yeah. Yeah. So, so oh, you know, cool. Move that chi around. Strap yeah. on something. You get, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, you know what happens? You, you fall in love. <laughs> your mind opens. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah mind, no. huh? uh, You know, no. It's it's. I think, I, like I said, I've always been a pretty open minded yeah. person, and there's, I'm you teasing know, you. 
Like going back to like just in terms of religion, you'll never hear me say God doesn't exist or a higher power doesn't exist because I can't prove that it doesn't, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're a scientist, you should never say something like that because yeah, you can't prove that it does exist. You can only kind of have feels, but I can't prove that it doesn't either, right? right? right, right. And that's like, you know, we're finding out more and more that the brain has an impact on everything. I, I tell people when like, when I've had them reversing for a while, what happens a lot is they tend to, when they start cutting again, they get like hyper stressed and you know, they get in that worried state of mind because they're afraid they're not going to lose weight and it's not going to work and, and this and that. And I'm like, you have to believe that this is going to work. You need to believe that this is going to work. Tell yourself it's going to work. Talk yourself through why it's going to work. Just like I visualize a big, every big lift I've ever hit, I had lifted that weight a thousand times in my mind before I ever touched it. Right. I had visualized that shit so many times. You have to visualize yourself losing weight. As dumb as that sounds, you have to visualize this working. The other thing you have to do is stop fucking around with your cuts. Cutting should be like war. Get in the deficit get in, dominate, and get the fuck out. These people who do really bad are people who kind of fuck around in diets for a long time. They're like, oh, they're not really serious, but they're restricting. But then they had like a overeating thing on the weekend and they, they, they fucked up whatever progress they made during the week. That's what I see with kinda, keto right now, yeah. big time. I, I, I don't think people realize how much this is uh, going to be a major backlash with keto, I think, in the next couple of years. Is I've, run, it. I've run in a ton of clients that are keto- Four days of the week, and yeah, then which they, they're not actually keto, then, right? You know. Right, exactly. <laughs> and then you, then you, then you eat and have fun on the weekends. It's like, dude, that person. I mean, you'd be far better off following a, a more balanced diet or a carb yeah. friendly diet if you're going to go binge on the weekends than if you're then right, running a keto four or five days and then going off the rails on a Friday or Saturday. And that's why I tell people we're going to do keto low carb. Hey, that's fine, but you better be ready to make that a lifestyle. Right, right, right. Because if you're constantly taking yourself in and out of ketosis, that's going to be tough. Mm. Like. Uh, ketogenic the adapting phase like the keto flu that it sucks right and so if you're always pulling yourself out of that and then having to go back in you're going to feel like shit a lot I, I, th I think it's important you come out of it every once in a while if you're keto unless it's medicinal medical you know ketogenic diet but this if you do it like that like two days on three days on one day off whatever you're, even you're that, carb cycling even that or even that's, yeah. not, that's all it is right it's yeah, not, even that if you're just coming out on a on a one day out of the week if you're coming out without a structure to it i, I don't right. think it's safe at all right, right because most people that's how they're, they're most people are treating it just like every other diet mm -hmm. you know i'm on this diet for four or five days i get a cheat day on saturday or sunday mm -hmm. and then they go and they eat whatever so, the fuck they want they don't i always count. tell people is if your diet's so great why do you feel like you need to cheat on it right <laughs> yeah. That's a good, yeah. That's a good well, keto is the greatest thing ever. Oh God, yeah. I can't wait to get my fries yeah. and burger on stop, the weekend. Stop right. banging other food. Yeah. 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 So yeah. <laughs> I do. I, I want to stay on the because I still want to get like uh, more tangible things from you with the holy things. I know there's people out, and I know it's a generic yeah. question. I keep going back to, but are there specific foods that you like to t Sorry, recommend? Yeah. Like like yams or I mean, where do you normally go for adding? You know, it, it's everybody's different, right? You've got to really. You know, like a good example is Holly. She doesn't have an off switch. We literally have a lockbox at our house because I like my Reese's Pieces and I like my Reese cups and I like my Skittles, you know, here and there. She can't, she can't have it. She, maybe it'll get different in the future after she's had, you know, more time in a surplus. I'm the same way too, though. I can't, yeah. if it's not in my house, I won't, I won't touch it. I'm good. Oh, she, it's so funny. If it's in the house, I'm going to come get it. You know, she's been like one of the things that uh, I think the reason we work well is because. I like the fact that she's very strong and independent, you know, in a lot of relationships in the past, the other person kind of like didn't want her to be independent, you know? Mm -hmm. So she's just been living on her own, doing her own thing, setting up her life exactly how she wants to set it up. In fact, it was funny the other day, she said something like, she's like I just want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I'm like, babe, that's not a reasonable expectation for most people, yeah. you know? But so it, she just didn't have that shit in her house. She wouldn't have anything in her house. She would only have, and literally like, not even like her cupboards when I, when I went to visit her one time uh, were bare, you know, like she only had as much food in her house as she would eat for the week, yeah. right? That was it. And that was how she ca balanced her calories for the week. But I mean, part of that's, you know, you can call that, oh, well, that's like a disorder or this and that. Or no, you can I, just call I, it being self-aware. I just, yeah, I, I say it's more self-aware. For me, it's self-awareness. I know that I have an issue with sugar because I fucking overconsumed it as a kid. Yeah. We could have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I always had candy all the way into my 20s. I mean, yeah. I, there, I never not had candy in my car, candy in my house. I used to finish almost every night with Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And I maintained a very lean physique because I was 
playing sports and I was lifting all the time. So I had a really bad relationship with sugar. Mm -hmm. Then as I got older, life slowed down. Like I can't do that anymore. Yeah. So for me, it's like, it's not an eating disorder. It's just, I know that, Hey, if I have it in the house, it's not a temptation because yep. I'm not, I don't want it so bad that I'll get in a fucking car and go drive to go get yeah. Ben and Jerry's at 10 o'clock at night. But if it's down in my freezer, and I smoke a little yeah. weed, and I'm watching my favorite show. <laughs> I will for sure walk downstairs and go do that. And that's yeah. for her. It's a, it's just pure accessibility. Yeah. Like if, actually, I wouldn't even need a lockbox if we just like put it outside in the fridge outside. She won't touch it. Mm. It's you just, know, it's just not close to it's her. A, it's more of a stress yeah. response, you right. know. But um, so she kind of just added in foods that she had been consuming a lot of anyway because when you know you're going up from 1400 to 1500 calories it's not like you're right, getting it's like a you're bunch adding more like one food, ounce of you know? something you're adding one ounce yeah, of this so or one ounce of that she was kind of still including like really feeling high satiety high volume low calorie foods now that she's at 2000 she's finding that okay now she can incorporate like a wine every night right. or she can you know have some rice instead of you know, cauliflower rice. Right. Like she can, she can do some of those because she really likes a lot of food volume. You know, um, I think that that's also uh, really interesting stuff. We uh, we gave a, a co uh, um, seminars with uh, Mendel Henselman's and her girlfriend, his girlfriend Sana, and uh, Sana talked a lot about the science of satiety. And actually, like even if you have like a um, a plate that is a similar color as your food, you'll you'll eat more. Mm -hmm. So oh, if really? you have yeah, <laughs> so if you have a like a plate that, interesting. that contrasts the color of your food, you you won't eat as much. I think it's like 20, 30 percent. And then if you uh, if you serve on a smaller plate, so that's another thing that people don't they underestimate the the sociological aspects of food. I'll tell people like, when was the last time you went to an event that did not have food? Mm -hmm. And if you went to an event that didn't have food, you would think it was weird, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, and then also dinner plates. Dinner plates in the eighteen hundreds were like this big. Uh, nobody could see this because I'm. You know, <laughs> they were small. They're yeah. small. They, they, they're small. They, they're, they've increased by like fifty percent in size. You know who knows a lot about this? Food manufacturers spend a lot of fucking money on understanding all of the science and and everything from of the color, they do. the color of their food, the texture, the amount of pressure you need to apply in order to crunch the food. Like they actually spend a lot of money on this stuff. Knowing they that do. they dial all, it's no different than like internet marketing where they know the color and the, the, the you know, the font yes. and all that stuff. Funneling. It's all, they split test everything and figure out like what mm -hmm. is going to make you eat more, which is why I'm always like processed food, man. Be careful because they, that shit's designed to make you eat more and yeah. it works really well. And I think one of the things is like when I talk about like my goal for most people is get them to a point where they're kind of intuitive eating, right? If they're not getting ready for a bodybuilding show or not targeted. You just warm my heart right now. But, but <laughs> like when I say intuitive, I don't mean kind of going by hunger signals because our hunger signals in this day and age are kind they're of fucked Right. Up. I think we're all on the same page and agree that intuitive eating is a destination you want, you should be trying to get to. Yeah. Most people are nowhere ready and, for that. And yeah. to be honest, if you've ever had an eating disorder, intuitive eating is probably not a reasonable expectation no, for you. No. Your hunger signals are pretty much fucked. Yeah. Um, just because of your association with, of food food with different totally. things. Um, what I mean by intuitive eating is just like what I do now. So I don't have like an app that I log my food in and I don't weigh my food and I go out to eat and stuff, but I'm just kind of keeping a running track in my head of, okay, I think that was about 50 grams of protein and 75 grams of carbs and 15 grams of fat, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, by the end, I'm probably a few hundred calories off per day, but here's the other thing. I don't think maintenance calories is a set point. I think it's a range. Of course. Well, I think you have a high end of maintenance that you maintain your body weight on and you have a low end that you maintain your body weight on. And that's why I also tell people, people will say, well, if I reverse diet up slowly, should I diet back down that way? Absolutely not. Right. Because here's the example I give. Uh, I, I was listening to a researcher and he was saying, well, obesity, if we look at it from age 20 to age 70, is basically overeating by about 20 calories per day. Mm -hmm. So he was just saying, if we just cut 20 calories out of our diet, we could, we could stop obesity. I promise you, if you cut 20 calories out of your diet a day, absolutely nothing will happen. Your body will adapt. Your yep. body will just adapt to it. Yep, right. it'll adapt. It has to be a big enough of a drop because for the same reason reverse dieting can work in terms of not having as much weight gain as you would predict based on the amount of calories you add in. If you diet too slow, you'll have the same thing in reverse, right? right? Where you're, you're actually not dropping weight. Now, there is another end of that. There is The other side of that is the psychological piece in which going slow may be 
easier and more feasible for people right. well, there's, than going too fast. Well, I was gonna say, so there's, there's thresholds. I was going to yeah. say, there's an extreme on both sides, right? Because if you were to diet, I mean, we're saying it's better to go harder, but if you were to go so hard that you're restricting- It's too big of a change in your life. It's too big of a restriction. Right, because eventually you may You're see, not going to adhere to it. Because I see this a lot, which you probably see this with a lot of the competitors and people you guys coach is they go to the diet and they boom, right away, they cut 1,500, 2,000 calories out of their yeah, diet. Yeah, it's too much. Way too much, right? Yeah. too fast. Yeah, yeah. And what I'll say is like, okay- so we have this maintenance range, and I think generally it's about 200 to 300 calories, right? On the So if you're in the middle, you could probably drop 100 or 150 calories and really not lose much weight mm -hmm. meaningfully. You could probably add 100 to 150 calories and not lose much weight or not gain much weight meaningfully if you're sitting in the middle, right? Um, so what I will usually do is think about, okay, what is the minimum amount to, to get out of that, that space, to actually trigger a response. Minimum effective right? dose. Right. Minimum effective dose. Right. So we talk about this with volume. Like we, I had a podcast with Eric Helms, Mike Israel, and uh, Greg Knuckles, where we were kind of arguing uh, max recoverable volume versus minimum effective dose. And I said, for advanced people, that's actually going to be about the same thing. <laughs> but, uh, it's about the same. We're actually arguing the same thing, whether you believe it or not. Yeah. But yeah. like for, for diet, I agree with Adam. Like you don't want to just, like if you start out and you're eating 30,000 calories a day and you just, cut it down to 2000. I mean, what happens when you adapt? Right. And yeah. now you've got to drop it again. Yeah. Now there is interesting information with diet breaks, like being, uh, I'm just reviewing, I'm actually going to be on a paper or we're submitting it, um, with some of the people who did the diet break research. Um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with it, with this research, but there was a recent study where they, um, so if you look at like refeeds or high carb days or carb cycling, sure. uh, if you equate calories for the week, it doesn't seem to make a difference on fat loss. Right. What's really interesting is there was a study that was recently done called the Matador study. Um, and they took people and they either straight calorically restricted them for uh, 16 weeks. Oh, I saw this. Or they did it for intermittently. Mm -hmm. So the- so It's like undulating or whatever. Right. So they would have people diet for two weeks, eat at maintenance for two weeks. Diet for two weeks, eat at maintenance. Diet for two weeks, eat at maintenance. So one group dieted for 16 weeks. The other- Dieted for 16 weeks, but with two weeks of diet breaks in between. So their total time was 30 weeks, right? Mm -hmm. We did a YouTube on this. What was really fucking cool was the people on the diet breaks lost way less lean body mass. They had better fat loss efficiency. That is per week of caloric restriction. They lost more fat mm -hmm. and lost more weight. And the group that was straight dieted for 16 weeks, they had metabolic adaptation. So they lost their, 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 um, metabolic rate decreased to a greater extent than would be predicted by the amount of fat and lean body mass they lost. Their, their metabolism slowed down. Right. Now, I agree, I agree with this. We did a YouTube on this. this you and we, I did we, we call this mini cutting and mini bulks, which yeah. we've been preaching this for three years. And when this study came out, it confirmed what we had experienced training clients, which, yeah. is, which is, I but never, I would never put per someone on a 12 week straight deficit. I would always put them on a general deficit, but I'd always intermittently throw in surpluses. You, yeah, surpluses or maintenance, and it just prevents that metabolic now adaptation. The, now the challenge with that is or thing, saying what we're saying right Attenuates. now. Attenuates. Yeah. The, the challenge with that is saying what we're saying right now, though, and people hanging on to that, and they're going, "Oh, cool. So you know, the boys say that I should undulate. I should have some of these high days, low days. Well, then I'm just going to wait till I feel like I want to eat more, and I'll eat more. Yeah. And then, the, and then there, and this goes back to the psychological piece for me is that. You know, people's it's gotta be controlled. Yeah, their people's hunger mm -hmm. signals are so off and when most times when you're craving or wanting things is when you're fucking sedentary, you're watching movies, you're not doing that stuff. And then when you're on it, you're eating yep. good and you're moving around. Like that those are the days that you should be eating that surplus. Yep. That's a good point. And that's something else I want to bring up with you, Lane, is we talk about how it's hard to trust the hunger signals, how how hard it is to control whether or not we overeat or or whatever. From my standpoint, now consider my context, right? I'm somebody that came from the whole eat every two or three hours, overfeed all the time, build muscle Didn't we all? mentality, right? For me, fasting was by far the most effective thing I've ever done in helping me become more intuitive with my eating. Because for somebody who fed themselves so often all the time, going without food for 48 to 72 hours there's the health benefits. We all know that and the anti-inflammatory effects and all that stuff. But psychologically speaking, or some people will say spiritually, my disconnection from food really allowed me to 
understand hunger signals because I thought I knew what hunger was. I thought I'd always felt hunger, but in reality, it's always cravings. What yeah. people think hunger is is Appetite cravings. Appetite versus hunger yeah, is different. Yeah, and, and cravings are connected to emotions, context, people around you. Yeah, am I at the movies? Now I want popcorn. Or now I want a beer because I'm having pizza or whatever. Hunger is totally different. And so for people like myself, because I would never recommend fasting to someone who has an eating disorder like bulimia, orthorexia, or, or anorexia. But for people in our space, fasting, if you want to talk about getting to a space where you can eat more intuitively – one of the best tools I've ever used. Because when you break those chains, it does a few different things. One is I identify like, oh, I eat when I'm bored or when I'm when I'm angry yeah. or when I'm stressed or whatever. The other thing too is, boy, your perception of food changes. In psych, you know, scientifically speaking, I'm sure there's receptors that downregulate and all this other stuff that happens. For example, you eat a lot of candy. Fruit doesn't taste as sweet. It just tastes more bland. Eliminate food for three days, eat a strawberry, and you'll see how, to, how, how sweet yeah, it is. Yeah, your taste receptors are actually very adaptable. Like You take somebody, like just take, uh, we were in Thailand a couple weeks ago, and don't ever tell somebody in Thailand that you want your sp- food spicy. Oh, are, did you do that? Fuck you up. Oh, <laughs> like, bad idea, like, dude. Because like, if you tell them you want no spice, then it'll be like the right amount of spice. Because you know? <laughs> they can't taste it. Like mm-hmm. if it's something that's like if they went to America and had American food, bland, they can't taste anything because mm-hmm. their receptors are adapted so much to really spicy foods. Same things happens with sugar, right? Like I actually tend to like things very sweet because I have a little bit of sweet tooth. And um, like a lot of uh, sometimes the complaints of like when I'll make somebody a coffee or something like that, oh man, a little sweet, you know, because yeah. that's my, my, my taste. Or um, if you have somebody who like is used to a really high salt diet, if you give them something low sodium, it can have all the flavors in the world, but they can't taste it because they're so used to a really high sodium food. Mm-hmm. High sodium food. That's me. So, you know, it's just very. That's Dude. this is why I get so pissed off at people who want to make this stuff like, oh, it's just carbs. Yeah. Really? Like you're telling me. So the other thing I get is like, okay, well, we've been told that protein's going to kill you. Carbs are going to kill you. Fats are going to kill you. So what the fuck are we going to do? you want to sit back and photosynthesize or what? You know, like it just, you know. What do you think this, with uh, Sean Baker going around talking? All carnivore the, diet. Yeah, you've seen him. I know you have. Mm, He's on Joe That's Ray. autoimmune issues 100%. Yeah. I, I, so I think that in general, if you tell somebody eat more protein, I think that that's probably good advice. I think eating only meat is probably not great advice, to be honest, um, because there are a lot of issues with, you know, like fiber is good, dude. Like yeah. fiber, fiber is good for your GI. Um, all the research we have, I mean, I, admittedly it's correlation, but you know, meat, I, w- I will say clearly, I don't think meat causes cancer in and of itself. It's, there's a very high association with colorectal cancer and processed meats. I think that's more to do with the fact that people who eat more processed meats tend to have just overall more unhealthy lifestyles, right? Agreed. And, and, you know, red meat and colorectal cancer. Well, people who eat more red meat tend to not exercise. They tend to not eat much fiber and they tend to uh, eat more uh, charred portions of, of meat, which uh, have what are called polyaromatic, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are also carcinogenic. But if you correct for all those three things, the association with meat and cancer is pretty weak. But again, I think... You know, if, if if my if my research and people I've worked with over the years have taught me anything, it's that most things are okay in small doses, even things we would consider bad. Um, some things are are a, a caveat to that. Trans fats, there doesn't seem to be like a, a good like a dose of, zo- a, of dose, a, yeah. a trans fat. Yeah. Uh, I think if you have small amounts of trans fats, it's probably not going to kill you. Don't trans you know? fats appear in nature also in some cases? I think, small that, cases, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's just chemistry, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So you, you have... Um, you know, it's just a cis versus a trans double bond and a fatty acid. Yeah. Um, so there's, so so too much of anything tends to be a bad thing. It's just it's just way more complex than people want to admit. No, I think if and and I also think and, and I also think look, human body's pretty adaptable. You can get away with a lot of things for, yeah. for a period of time. So you can eat just potatoes. For a little while and, and be okay. Diet. There's and, a banana diet. Yeah, whatever. yeah. And then you can say, look, I just eat potatoes and I feel healthy. And it's like, well, yeah, keep it up long enough and then, you know, maybe see what happens. Well, and, and again, like pe- people are going on this diet and they're like, oh, I, I feel so much better. Well, you feel better because you're losing weight and your blood sugar is normalizing and all that. But you could have got at that still eating some carbohydrate, yeah. you know, like it's the restriction that matters, you know. Now, 
I think what's individual is how you produce that restriction. If, if, you know, cause I was on, um, uh, Chris Bell's doing another uh, documentary, and they I interviewed. Saw that. They interviewed me for like two hours on this. What's the name of it? I forget. I don't think they have a name yet. He no, said they do. I saw it on his his his, uh, his on his Instagram. Well, I no, think. that's a different one. I think. Oh, it is. That's a different one. Oh, okay. Um, what are you talking about then? Yeah. So they they filmed me for two hours, and they kind of we went through a, a lot of different diets, and you know what I said by the end was like, you know, there are some general rules. Calories do count, but whatever whatever allows you to. Because, you know, people want to, again, people want like the perfect diet that's going to solve all their problems. And the fact is, if we could just get people to do like three things, they would be so much healthier. You know, don't eat like an asshole. <laughs> Exercise one. a little more and get some sleep. Yeah. Like that's 95% yeah. of it, plus, you know. Plus the perfect diet. If you, if you do find the perfect diet for you, that's the perfect diet for you right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like your body changes, circumstances change. And I don't know about you, Lane, but the further we go, you know, the longer I'm in fitness, the deeper I get, the more I realize. We're getting back to the strap on? The, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's lots of, I mean, you wow. start to get more. I'll tell you what, we, we had, uh, uh, you know, we had dinner with a, a good friend of ours who, uh, you know, I, we, I consider just a, a brilliant man when it comes to just wellness, that whole sphere of wellness. And before he ate, he looked like he prayed over his food. I don't know what he was doing, but he took a second, did something, and then started eating. And later on, I asked him, I said, are you praying before you eat? And Because I, I didn't think he was religious. And he goes, no. He goes, I ask, and this is what he said, and I'm paraphrasing. I ask the food if it wants to be a part of my body. I ask my body if it wants the food. And he does this whole esoteric thing. And I, as I'm listening to him, I'm like, well, that sounds ridiculous. That's silly. But then I think about it, and I realize the across all cultures and, and religions forever, there's always there's a practice that people tend to do before eating. And I do know, and we just talked about this earlier in this episode, how important state of mind is to digestion, to health, to all these different things. I mean, I can think of something right now and change neuro neurochemicals. I can change hormone, you know, fluctuations just by a thought. And it makes sense, especially if you're a stressed out individual and pushing your body really hard, to stop and take a second and let your body relax and get in parasympathetic state before you eat your food versus cram the food in your mouth between clients mm. or whatever and how big of a difference that makes. Then we're on- uh, That's Holly, actually. Yeah. And she, it, I can't, eat, like if I try to eat as fast as she does, I can't do it. So it I makes was this, a big difference. I was the same way, and I think it's trained from me training myself to compete and get so many meals in to get my calories up. So it was a game changer when, I, I don't, was it Paul that we met with or who it was when with the water thing? Paul. And I don't never, drink water. I've never food. like actually tried to eat my food with no fluid whatsoever. And you do that one time, and it's like poof, for somebody who shovels food, you realize like, whoa, I'm not even really fully digesting yeah, my food because I'm not even fully chewing it before I swallow it. I'm taking a bite. I'm rinse, washing it down. I'm taking another. I'm taking pills worth of food. Yeah. I'm not really chewing it. But the, these things make a big difference. And then we spoke to a, uh, another gut health expert and they were like, oh no, I recommend to all my clients with really bad gut issues after we've identified whether or not there's issues with you know, uh, imbalances of you know, gut microbiome and damage and all that stuff. One of the things practices that we tell them is learn to meditate right before you eat. Five minutes of meditation, then eat. And it makes a big difference. And speaking from someone who has who's had gut issues in the past, it does make a big difference. So my question to you is, do you find yourself like the deeper you get in the realm of, of health and fitness, the more you start to look, you, the more you start to see all these other, what you may have considered weird and esoteric and stupid five years ago. Now you're starting to say things that maybe you would have laughed at five years ago. Sure. Yeah, well, of was, wasn't, wasn't religion our first science? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think, um, you know, it's everything matters. It just depends on how much it matters. So I try to keep in mind, like, what the, what is the hierarchy of importance? What are the big rocks? Right? Like, because if you want to get right down, like, we're talking about plate size and consumption and all that kind of stuff. Like, if you if you want to, like, do every single thing right, it's going to be like a full-time job. You know what I mean? So people don't have that time. Mm. So I'm just trying to give them a few things and a few concepts that they can, they can take home. Because the average person, you know, it's just so hard. Again, like, your time is limited, right? So... People ask, how do I not get fleeced by people? And as bad as it sounds, you kind of have to pick people who you trust. You know, that that's, Greg Knuckles said something that was really pertinent and I, I loved it because I never thought about this way, but it's so true. And I think you guys will have a, mm. I hope. He said, people are really good 
at determining whether someone else has more knowledge on a subject than they do. Right? So you talk to somebody for a few minutes, typically you can tell if they have more knowledge about something than, than you do. What they're really bad at is determining of two people who have more knowledge than them, who is the more knowledgeable of the two. Mm-hmm. They're really bad at that, right? Like I love fishing, right? And I follow a few different shows. Um, but if, you know, let's say two anglers are, are, that are experts are having a debate about which knot is better for a topwater lure, well, I, oh, fuck if I know, if I, I'm not actually going to go in and get a, a testing apparatus and see which one has a better breaking strength. Oh, well, he says this one actually allows more lure movement and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to end up probably siding with the person who I like better. You're going to side with the right? better communicator, the better yeah. salesman. So, and, and that's one of the problems out there is scientists typically aren't good communicators. Terrible. Right. There's a reason, you know, we we all have like some kind of a little bit of like social problems. You know what I mean? Cause we, we like getting stuck in a lab for 12 hours and not talking to anybody, you know, now I like talking. So I'm a little bit of an aberration in terms of a scientist, but um, we tend to be poor communicators. But the other thing we do is, you know, scientists with integrity usually put things in, in context, right? So when you talk to me, I'm sitting here saying, well, yeah, this thing matters, but you have to think about it in terms of this thing. And, you know, it's not magic. And the, versus somebody up there saying very confidently, very authoritatively, nope, it's insulin. Mm-hmm. It's carbs. Mm-hmm. This is why you're fat. This is why you can't lose weight. And people are, they're, who are you going to go with? Yeah. Are you going to go with the person who's really, really confident a lot? So, you know, when people say, you know, I'm, I, I'm big on education, right? But I've met some people who don't have degrees in nutrition who are very, very intelligent, right? But when I say things like uh, that I value education so much, it's not that people, there are people who are scuzz bags who have PhDs, who would sell, who would, who would fucking promote anything as long as they could get some cash for it. What I say is, there's, what the difference is, is our levels of confidence, right? If somebody's had to do a higher degree, typically that was really difficult and it required them to do a lot of thinking and fail a lot and to, to get to that point. So I automatically tend to um, give them a little bit more credibility, right? So it just increases my confidence in that person. It doesn't mean they're foolproof, right? It just increases my level of confidence, right? And the more you learn, there's a phrase, I forgot what the phrase was, but the more you learn, at a certain point you realize, like, oh shit, I know way less than I thought I did. Oh, 100%. And I can't Dunning, remember. Dunning, Dunning Kruger you, effect. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah, that's a re- <laughs> that's a real thing. Hell yeah. You know. Yeah, I think. But I will say this in terms of our industry. I'll say this, Elaine. You've been in it a while. I've been in it for a long time. So have these guys. There's a lot of bullshit out there for sure. The fitness industry is one of the worst. But generally speaking, the average consumer seems to be more informed than they were 15 years ago. I agree with that. I think that. The difference between now and 15 years ago is there's actually some good information to counter out the shit that's out there, yep. right? 15 years ago, evidence-based stuff didn't even fucking exist, no. right? The idea of, you know, um, you know, flexible dieting or anything like that, that would just be, nope, just eat chicken and rice, you right. know? like well, most, actually, most of us have been lifting for over 15 years. Our education came from muscle and fitness. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, have, I had a pro shit. bodybuilder contact me his diet was absolutely fucking atrocious. Like he eats only chicken every day except for oatmeal, which we'll have in the morning and no vegetables. And then when he gets his last final weeks, it's tilapia and (laughs) yeah, I'm like, Oh, you're only deficient in about 50 million different things, you know, plus you're having Holly actually, um, when she was in Australia, um, some of the guys she knew that were pro bodybuilders there, um, she did a, a nutritional analysis of their diets and found that they were like, Frank deficient in some nutrients and like we're consuming toxic levels of selenium. Like, so, and unfortunately we looked at these as people. From as like what? The, what, what, what were they, what were they intaking? I forget what it was, but they were, yeah, these people are like our beacons of nutrition. No, they yeah. shouldn't, they shouldn't be. I think they, 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 they look the way they do in spite of, in spite of their diet and training. Yes. Well, you know? it goes back to what you were saying in the very beginning is the, the calories thing is that calories is one of the bigger rocks still. And so if you're somebody who can restrict a lot of calories and expend a lot for a long period of time, like it's inevitable you're going to lean out. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you will get, you will start to get shredded if you do that long enough. Yeah. If you're only eating chicken, it's pretty easy to calorically restrict. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
you know, it's, it's, but somebody will look at them and say, wow, they look great. I want, and unfortunately, like, I mean, it's why I get business. Mm -hmm. Like if I was, if I was pudgy, I wouldn't get business. Dude, I, I, I'll tell you, I always enjoy talking with you on the podcast and you know, I, I, I know you can, you have strong opinions, but you back them up with science and you can be, some people think you're abrasive. I see you as a very open-minded person, uh, who's open to discussion. And I appreciate that whether I agree with you or not. And I do often agree with you. I really do. And I'd say we agree on 90% of shit. I, and I, I, I appreciate, but I do appreciate your openness to discuss. And I, I wish there were more people like that in fitness. I will say this though, and I'll go on record saying this. I think no, cause I know so last time I talked to you fast again. Yes. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you it will blow your mind yeah. because the psychological I component did fast of it. when I had food poisoning. I didn't eat shit. That doesn't count. Hours. That doesn't <laughs> count. It's, not the same. it's gotta be voluntary. Do like a 48 hour fast. It's, you know what? Talking about the way you talk about Holly and her relationship to food, it will blow your mind because you'll, you'll break the chains long enough to make those examinations and talk about intuitive eating. It takes it to a, a whole new level. Absolutely, whole new level. Uh, it also just add another tool to your already crazy tool belt that you can use with clients yeah. too. I use it all the time as a tool for clients to teach them, especially Awareness. with our bodybuilder type clients that are so attached to the six That's meals. That's the ones that really six benefit. Six to eight meals a day. Nothing will fuck up a competitor in the middle of their competition and go, hey, guess what? Tomorrow we're fasting. And ah, I'm going to lose out. all my muscle. Right. Freak out on them. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that you know, you're going to lose all your muscle from fasting or anything like that. I, I think that it's not... You know, it's not going to be an anabolic situation, but I don't think you're going to lose a bunch of muscle from it. You know, um, especially not one day. Yeah, um, you might, you might if you go three days, but it comes right back. It's not a big deal. Yeah, that's that's the other thing. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I try to be like I said, open minded. You know, what really gets me is, um, you know, like I, I got in a debate on Twitter with an ophthalmologist who was speaking <laughs> really authoritatively about nutrition, hmm. and then had the audacity to call my occupation a joke he's like oh well nutrition is just memorization it's like you fucking arrogant jackass <laughs> like really what was the debate over uh, the insulin's the cause of every problem from yeah. war to famine to you know whatever Dude, how, many, I, I, how many debates a day are you in these days <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep up anymore. I used to keep up with dude. Some you did. You did start some shit or said some shit about our friend Ben Greenfield. To, oh, to, to, that's to, him to getting go, at Joe Rogan. I, I know you've been on Joe Rogan's Rogan ass for like a, a year He's and a half now, you, two huh? years. Ben is probably a very nice guy. Oh, you guys, you would love him. I. He may be a little too pseudoscience for him. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, but. Uh, I dislike his marketing approach. But oh, that's, you know, that's just the my very first time system. he interviewed us. I called him out on it. The very first time. Yeah, Remember that? Yeah, yeah, we were yeah. sitting, we were talking. Said, did you just do like fucking six commercials like on our fucking show right Amazon. now? Yeah. But you, you know what? Just well, that's see, that's what I sentence. probably can learn from marketing stuff because I'm terrible at marketing myself. Dude, there, like, and there is by the end, I'm like, oh, oh, by, uh, by the way, I have a contest prep book and uh, I coach people, yeah, yeah. you know, because I just like. I like helping people. Right after I you like just got done punking somebody. Oh, but yeah. You just got done insulting somebody. Then you're like, oh, by the way, if you want to pick up my contest, bro. Yeah. <laughs> but Thanks, it, Ben. Appreciate that segue. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. But if you if you meet Ben and you get to know him, because at first- that's There's we no the same other thing. human on He's this so earth. He's so like that for real. There's, that's how yeah, he is. There's no other human on this earth that I would want more than, than Ben Greenfield. Stretching the boundaries. Yeah, doing that weird shit. Like, if mm. there's anybody, if there's another guy who I went to and I said, like, I want to go, like, I, there's some shit that came out that sounds all pseudoscience-y, and I want to know about it. Like, that's the guy I want to know who went and applied it to himself because his level of intelligence, the way he lives his life is so consistent that when he adds these variables, he's a really cool person to talk to as far as like what he sees or notices. There's, I, I've never met somebody so consistent with their life as this guy. Oh yeah, to a to a fault. I yeah. mean, it, it's oh, it's this thing, man. It's this thing. Well, I mean, like my my thing is like, and I don't want to come at Rogan too much because I actually really like Joe Rogan. Like I think you're just be, trying to get his. Attention. Be careful. He's a big mind pump fan. He listens a lot. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like uh, you know. I kind of, a bunch of people asked for me to be on the show. I, you know what? It's his damn show. If he ever wants me, I'd be totally up for that. You know what I mean? Why do you think but, he doesn't want you on the show? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, he follows me on Twitter, so I, I don't know. Uh, oh, so maybe, he does follow you on Twitter. Yeah, maybe I come across as too abrasive and he thinks I'm going to come in there and yell and scream and drop F-bombs. I mean, that's not how I am. I feel like he would want you yeah. on the show. <laughs> <laughs> that would work well. Um, maybe but, it's your approach. You know, maybe. I mean, mm. but it's, you know, it's one because, you know, it's not that he won't have a dissenting opinion because he had Andy Galpin on there, you know. 
Um, so I don't know, but I mean, at the end of the day, people get mad about it, but I'm not real mad about it. It's his podcast. He can do whatever the hell he wants with it. Yeah. You know? Have you and Andy linked up yet? I know Andy. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. We talk every once in a while. I like Andy. Uh, yeah, I like him too. He's very good. Very yeah. smart guy. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, like, I, that kind of frustrated me a little bit because it's just like, I just noticed with nutrition more than anything, he kind of has people on to confirm his bias. You know what I mean? I'm really glad he had Andy on. I'm really glad he had Dom DiGostino on because those guys are going to shoot it straight, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, some of the other people, I'm just like, fuck, man. Because I, I know he's a smart dude, but you can't be an expert about everything, right? So if you kind of fall into that track of, oh, this worked really well for me and I like it. But then, you know, when you say things like sugar is poison, hey, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just, I guess I kind of was, frustrated it's like all right we're gonna have pseudoscience guests on but we can't have a real scientist on you know like like <laughs> i mean be, but, but that's probably the, but it might again, be the approach like, adam yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think when you insult the, sh- the guy on the the guys on the show you're almost insulting the show no right? but here's the thing is i actually think joe rogan is very very um very smart guy and i really enjoy listening to him like I, that's how i learned anything about mma was yeah. i loved mma i loved watching you the yeah. ufc mostly a lot of it because i actually stopped watching really because he wasn't on it anymore like mm-hmm. because like he made grappling fun to watch mm-hmm. you know yeah. because he explained exactly what was going on and he's a libertarian you know we have a lot of the same views um uh, so I think he's actually a very intelligent, pretty open-minded guy. I think once uh, I th- he, I what, think once he meets you, he'd like you. What, what what frustrates me is I feel like he's kind of gotten taken for a ride by a few people who he he trusts. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, so like, I, I maybe that's okay. This is what I'll mm-hmm. tell you. I think you're wrong, and I think that probably I think Joe is is that intelligent and that so many. So why I think Ben Greenfield came on the show the time that he came on the show was because Ben Greenfield was trending so heavily all over the all over the world uh, that time because of his penis injection thing that just happened. Oh, so Joe's uh, Joe's smart knowing that like he's got a relationship with the guy already. Yeah. He's all over the place and that's absolutely where he wants to take him because that's what's going to drive views and Oh no. So I, I think I think I think there's more strategy behind like, Oh probably. Right, he he caught Sean Baker on the way on the way up right when yeah. Sean Baker was uh he he got did he get Jordan Peterson too? Did he get he, Yes. He, yeah. Jordan times. Peterson on the way up. He, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. he's, I think it's more about that than it is like, oh, I respect it. I mean, that's how, when we bring so guests- So you're saying my career's on the way down? <laughs> <laughs> you're going to do something crazy, Lane. No, yeah. I, I, we've talked a lot of- All right, penis injections coming up. We've yeah. Ta- yeah, we've talked a lot about strap-ons Except and nutrition, check my ball sack nutrition this, whole, this whole episode. But I, I want to take us and like speculate a little because I think it's fun when we get another intelligent guy on here to talk about things that we don't always know everything about, but fun to debate stuff like this. What are your thoughts? Have you seen Ready Player One, first of all? No, I haven't yet. Okay, so th- that's beside the point. I just want to ask your thoughts on what you think that tech is doing to us and humans. Like, I'm, I'm noticing some things right now with posture, uh, even with myself that oh, I yeah. that I never. Yeah, like it's mm-hmm. really it's it's worse than I thought, and and I and I'm aware of it, right? So I can't imagine some of these kids. Also, the addictive properties that come with it. If you read like Andy Galpin's uh, Unplugged or Adam Atler's Irresistible, both great books along this along these lines. But what do you think? What do you think about tech in, in general? What it could be doing to us over health, overall health wise? I think it's like anything. There's good and bad stuff. You know, I think tech is going to help people um, get more information and more uh, ability to do things. Like just look at the apps that are out there. Just you know, right down to tracking and measuring your heart rate variability and, and doing these sorts of things. And in the future, we're going to be able to get you know, quick tests to know, oh, well, you have this genetic polymorphism, you know, you should do X, Y, Z. See, but that with that point being made, don't you think that's making us even more disconnected? It's a good example of that was when we first got navigation. How cool was it when we no longer had to open up these big ass? Well, maps? I, don't, I don't even remember anybody's phone number. Right. Well, no, you're right. Yeah. Right. So I used to have a fucking. Notebook so my in point is that these things that we we celebrate as because and I'm a fan too, and I'm not knocking. I'm just you know speculating here. I mean. Don't you think that it could get to the point where you become so disconnected because you rely on all these tools? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, God forbid. We, did you know a few years ago there was a slow, solar flare that came dangerously close yeah. to the Earth? Yeah. Would have knocked out all, like, electricity for, like, it would have taken three years to get the Earth's been, we gone Think about how age. fucked we would have been, right? Because yeah. who even knows how to, like, okay, somebody can repair an iPhone, but, like, setting up, like, a basic, like, from the bottom up electrical 
circuit and whatnot. Like, there's people that do it, but we'd have been in a world of hurt. Oh, like, yeah. Like, you know, that, that, those, those fucking doomsday people would have been laughing at all that. Ah, see, we told you, you know? <laughs> so, um, I mean, there's pluses and minuses. I think overall, you know, anytime there's, there's a, some kind of technological advancement, it's always, it's always going to be, there's pluses and minuses to it. Right. But I think that one of the things I've learned about in life is change is inevitable and it's coming whether you like it or not. Right. So that whether or not it's a good or bad thing, it's here. So mm. I agree with you. Like as somebody with cervical spine issues, right. Like looking down at your phone, like I actually try to make a conscious effort to go like put my phone up in my, like at eye level and not just bend down to look at it. Right. And not be slumped over and whatnot. I, I think that there are things that are going to help offset some of those things. I think overall, if I had to say one or the other, I think tech is probably a good thing. Yeah, you know, I, I would agree. Do but you, do you re, do you regulate your usage of your like now you're, you're in a relationship? Do you find like okay, I'm I'm, I'm going to only have phone time at this time because it's taken away from. So one of the things I've I've had to acknowledge, and you know. Um, as something that was a drawback on me is I tend to be way too engaged in social media and my emails and all that kind of stuff. Like, but I'm just a very motivated person. Like I want to make a difference. I really enjoy interacting with people. You know, this gives me ability to interact with people. Um, and you know, in my past relationship, um, that was a big gripe and you know what? Rightly so. Um, that's something that I have to take accountability for is like, I was way too into my phone. Like have my head. Part of that was cause you know, if you're unhappy, you kind of sure. distract yourself and sure. whatnot. But yeah, that, that was my fault, you know? Um, and now like I, I, I can say I'm still in it too much, hundred percent, but I can say that, you know, like when, when Holly and I go out, like if we're going to bring the phones out, we're like, all right, I'm going to do a post about this. Is that Okay. Because just maybe we haven't had time to today or whatever, and then if we agree, if we both agree to it, then it's it's fine to have it out. But after that, phones go away, and we don't we don't look at them. You know, when I'm with my kids, I used to be on my phone all the time. Now, when I'm with my kids, I'm with my kids. You know, I tell my clients every other weekend, you're gonna have a delayed response from me with your update because I'm with my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm trying to be with my kids and be conscious and have fun. And you know what? I've actually enjoyed that time so much more now. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but yeah, Holly, you know, Holly called me out on it many times. She's like, she's like, I love Lane. You're my favorite person in the world. You're, you're everything I want in a relationship when I get Lane, right. you know, she's like, but when your head's in your phone, I don't get Lane, you know? So she's like, if you want, you know, more from me, you should give me more. She's hundred percent right. You know, see, that's so, great communication from her and self-awareness on your part. How many people do you think are like that, though? You know, we we uh, we read a book. But, well, sorry. We listened to it, <laughs> audio, audio, uh, audio book called um, Your Brain on Love, The Neurobiology of Healthy Relationships by uh, Stan Tatkin. And he's a neuroscientist who studies uh, attachment theory in children. And basically, you know, a lot of the book is basically like your relationship with your parents dictates a lot of how you interact with your partner. So he talks about like islands versus waves and anchors. And like when we were listening to her, like, holy shit, like you really, it really helps you understand not only why your partner is the way they are, but why you are the way you are. Right. So Holly would be like, what's well, like an island. So when she gets stressed, her kind of auto regulation response is like, she, if she'll get, if she gets stressed enough, you, she literally won't talk. Like you cannot get her to talk mm. if she's stressed enough. Whereas if I'm really stressed out, I'm like over communicating. Like I'm Verbal trying diarrhea. to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm really trying to like, like what's wrong, what's wrong with you, you know, like that sort of thing. And like, it's been really hard to like, like. I'm the kind of person that like, if she's stressed out, I want to know what the problem is. I want to fix the problem. I want to help the problem. I've had to get to the point where, Oh, if she's like really stressed out and getting to the point where she's not talking anymore, communicating anymore, that means she needs space and I need to go outside or go for a walk or something like that and just give her some space. And that usually does the trick, you know, but that's so weird for me because the best thing, like if I'm stressed out, the best thing she can do is just walk up and give me a hug. You know what I mean? But that's why like, and you, people tend to give affection and love the way they want to receive it. Have you read right? the love languages yet? 
That's yes. a good, that's a good yeah. one for you guys to read. So that's that's part of it, right? So like, I'm a I'm a uh, my number one thing by far is words of affirmation. Probably because I was picked on a lot growing up, of course. and so like people told me I wasn't worth a shit. So now having my partner, you know, and that like is that's like all the way at the bottom of her list. So it is not a natural, intuitive thing for her to give compliments, right? Uh, and then number two, uh, at least with her, it's like physical touch. So like um, just like and her things are uh, quality time and acts of service, right? So she's so busy and she has so much going on. Like how she perceives it is, Lane did the dishes. Lane cleaned this up because I'm, she calls me the man who sees no mess. Mm. Like, mm. Um, like knowing that I took that time out of my day to give her back time. Right. That's like, like, sh- it's that's huge, how she, it's huge for her. But like, I think a lot of people, you know, in the book, um, uh, Stan Tatkin, he talked about how after age 25, if you fall in love with somebody, like, yeah, you can make mistakes, but most people's picker isn't broken you know, after age 25, like you fall in love with somebody because something is familiar to you. Right. Um, and we don't exactly know what causes it, but something causes it. And people say, Oh, I keep picking the wrong person or this and that. And the reality is, is you probably one, uh, I heard another podcast, I think it was with, um, the guy who's in, in inside quest. Um, Tom? Tom? Tom. Yeah. yeah. Actually, oh, okay. I got, I, I messed up there. Yeah. I actually like Tom, but he's mm-hmm. awesome. Um, but he, uh, he said, um, him and his, his, uh, partner or wife, I'm, I'm not sure. Lisa. If Lisa. Yeah. yeah. They, they do relationship theory. Yeah. And they, they were like, you have to give somebody the keys to the kingdom, mm-hmm. right? Like you have to tell, you have to, this is really hard for some people is like to tell them, Hey, I need this because you're afraid of being judged or whatever. But like, you have to tell your partner, I need this. Lisa, Lisa, Bill, you talked about that on our show when we interviewed her. She talked about that was a, a practice they do every week, which I actually implemented after them where Katrina and I, at the end of the week, will look at it and they call it their one selfish desire. Like, what's your one selfish desire that you want selfishly this week or that you want to do, whatever that may be, whether it be, I want to go sit at a bar and go watch the basketball playoffs, you know, or whatever, yeah. or I want to go sit on the beach and read by myself or whatever mm-hmm. it may be, how important that is to the relationship. Yeah. And, but like people say, Oh, communication, 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 but not just talking, but like actually saying, this is what I need. And say, so basically relationships come down to, can that other person meet what you need in a relationship? And can you meet what they need? Cause everything else you can fucking figure out, you know, but if somebody can't meet your needs, you know, it's probably not going to work. And if mm-hmm. you can't meet their needs or aren't willing to meet their needs, because sometimes, like I said, Holly doesn't, she's not really a complimentative person. She's not like mean or anything like that. It's just not something that's intuitive for her. Right. But she also knows that she doesn't have to do it a bunch, but I need that. Like that's something that I actually need. Right. So I'll see it too sometimes where it's like not natural to her, but she'll go ahead and say it anyway. <laughs> you look but nice I appre- today. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate that because I appreciate that even more so because I know it doesn't come naturally. So that actually took, as weird as it sounds, that actually took some kind of self-sacrifice to do that, right? Just mm-hmm. like when I make the bed or because like if it's up to me, I eat off paper plates and I'd never make my bed. In my mind, why would I, why the hell would I make the bed? I'm just going to get back into it. That's right. Right. So, so that is not something that's intuitive me, with me, but I do it because I know it's important to her. Right. Right. So all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we still like the other thing Stan Tatkin talked about that I really liked was, uh, he said, um, get out of your mind. The idea that there's a low maintenance human, like there is no such thing. Nothing is a bigger pain in the ass than another human being. In fact, when you get married, it should say, I take you to be my pain in the ass. But, you know, most people do better with a partner. Most people do better with a partner than they do. (laughs) Most people do better with a partner because two people can do more than one. Right. Right. Um, But yeah, like just listening to that, like I would encourage anybody like listen to the show who's in the self-development, go get that book. Like even if you're single, go get that book because you'll understand yourself way better and it's better to, like, some people would be scared off in a relationship if somebody said, hey, this is important to me, this is what I need. But if you scare that person off, then they weren't right they for weren't you right anyway. They weren't right for you. you know? yeah. Yeah. Nothing mm-hmm. like, a, nothing like, and I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience, nothing like a divorce to, to really get you to reflect and become growth-minded when it comes to relationships. Well, and being accountable for the reasons that I was unhappy were partly self-induced. That's right. That's you right. Know? But that takes a lot of self-awareness and... It, it, 
you know, situations like that, you can either crumble under them or you can look at them and be like, all right, let's learn from this. Yeah, and I mean, like, that's... I could tell after having gone through that, I never want to do that shit again, Mm-mm. you know? And uh, and the things that have gone on in my life in the last two years, it's like, well, if you learn a lot from your mistakes, I've learned a fucking shitload, you know? So <laughs> I... um you know, I think that it's, it's, and it's funny cause I still get people like who will like really just, you know, rake me over the coals for what happened on my social media, this and that. And uh, I mean, I get it. You know, I was a pretty judgmental person before this, this whole thing went down. But, uh, now when we talked last, you were, you were still kind of going through the whole avatar thing. Are you, is that done and over done. with? That's all done. done. Everything, done. everything work out the way you wanted to, and um, you know, in a mediation, it, it, they say it's a good mediation if both sides walk out pissed off, <laughs> you know. So I think it was probably fair, okay. you know. Um, uh, and you know what? Like, I don't really look at what they're doing. I don't, I, I don't even know if they're still in existence. But I really, you know, I don't really follow what they were doing. Most of that I got from you, so yeah. I, don't, I don't know if they're growing or not or dying or what's going on with the business model. Yeah, no uh, idea. Yeah. I, I, I kind of look at that as like a, you know, it's like, do you want to look up your ex-girlfriend stuff and see what she's doing? Like, <laughs> probably, you know, if she's doing bad, it's probably not going to help you. If she's doing great, it's, it's not nice to see you. when she gets fat. You know what I'm saying? Let's be, let's be, come on, let's be honest. You know what I'm saying? It does make you feel good inside a little bit. Come but, on. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's um, you know, I'm so focused on like what's in front of me now that like I, I grieve that, I mourn that and that was, that was done and, uh, you know, really don't. I don't really think about it much day to day. What, well, so what does that look like for you right now? I mean, you're, it sounds like you're, you got a, a major client load. If you guys are managing almost 100 people, that's a lot of people to be managing for yeah. sure. I would mis- assume that that's a majority of what you're doing right now. Are you touring and doing a lot of seminars right now? What are you we're, doing? We're doing, we're doing a little bit of everything. You know, we're, we're, um, we put a lot into the, the ebook. Um, How's you know, that going? Very well. Very well. We sold, uh, you know, almost 5,000 copies of that book, awesome. wow. which which for an ebook on bodybuilding is pretty legit. That's, That's fantastic. Yeah, it's very um, legit. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll definitely be doing, um, you know, we thought about doing an audio book of that. Also uh, possibly doing a hard, like an actual physical copy mm-hmm. of that. That's possible. Um, doing more ebooks. You know, that's, that's. I really enjoyed writing that book, yeah. you know, and there's so much new data even since I wrote it. Like I would love to go back and do an updated version and then do a fat loss book, uh, do a powerlifting book, do all this kind of stuff. Oh, excellent. You know? We're also, um, you know, um, I can't really do an automated nutrition system right now for reasons I can't discuss. Oh yeah. <laughs> discuss. How long is that for, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I understand that there is a, a, d- a demand for that. Uh, but what we, what I can do is, um, uh, you know, uh, exercise automation stuff. So, uh, we've, we've done, um, the workout builder on biolane.com. So basically we now put up, you know, different training templates that are customizable. And this is my coach Andres and I, so he's my powerlifting coach, really, really smart guy. You guys are going to love talking to him. Very brilliant, especially when it comes to uh, stress management. Um, and uh, we have all these templates and basically it's like 13 bucks a month and you get access to all these templates that range from, they cover the whole gambit, you know, of anybody who wants to, to strength train or, or if you're a female and you want to get a bigger butt, you know, like we have all that stuff. If you're a high level powerlifter, we've got that, you yeah. know, if you're a, a big time bodybuilder, we've got that. So for 13 bucks a month, it's, it's, it's hard to beat. We've had a lot of really positive feedback. People saying, man, it's the best 13 bucks a month I spend. And then obviously they also get, um, our restricted content, you know, our articles, videos, that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. Um, and so we're, we're focusing on that, you know, putting more into that. Um, we're also, uh, putting more into just like research and like, you know, basically like building for the future, you know, understanding like, like Holly and I go through so much research and even on, to keep so much data on our own clients just so in the future, like, we can, um, you know, make things that are better. You, you know, know? I, I don't want to get you in trouble, but God, that's a, that's fucking bullshit. You can't do anything with the nutrition calculator. It's probably part of the mediation, bro. That's so. fucking. We're all in your in, in our business. What we do, like, that's crazy to me. Like that, they could even get make that happen. Well, how the fuck do you navigate around that? Um. Yeah, it's really hard to, to address this because there's a you know a you can't even talk about it. Even there's a, a, a non disclosure. I mean. There's a non-disparagement clause, 
So, you know, it's kind of... Come on, you're a communicator. <laughs> find, a way, find a way. Yeah, I'm really, I mean, I'm interested in this, yeah. and I think that's just for our profession and what we do. I mean, you're cutting one of your limbs off. Like, they, come on, you can't. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's, uh, it's tough because you know it was not my choice to leave the company. Yeah. You know? But, um, you know, sometimes to to get something, uh, and not take it to the point where uh, both parties get destroyed. And when you're talking about a mediation, mm. um, both parties have to compromise. Okay, so, so so part of that is you compromising too. It's not just like they said, this is the- He probably got something in returns. Typically how it works, like I'll get this, you get that type of deal. There's a, I'll just say that both both sides made compromises. Okay. Yeah. So, so And that's so, obviously a major compromise for you, right? Of course. Yeah. yeah. So, wow. Uh, but yeah, you know, like I don't have any, uh, you know, like I learned a lot. Um don't wish them, you know, I'm sure they did what they thought was best for their business. Um, you know, mm. like sometimes things don't work out just like a relationship. It doesn't mean that people are evil people or anything like that. Um, uh, business is business. You know, yeah, yeah. shit yeah. happens. Right. You just, you, you work, you and Holly work together and did you just buy a house together? Yeah. So we just bought a house. Okay. Um, are you, are, congrats, is there, it looks beautiful. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Is there any, do you have any fear of, like commitment because you guys are working together, bought a house together very quickly. Do you ever get scared? Like, do you oh, ever fuck, think that I don't she's, wanna... Do you ever think she came after you just to get closer to us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's, I feel like it's, that. You know, you know what's funny is you know Holly is a very beautiful woman, and uh, it's funny. Like, I'll pretty much get people on like a weekly basis who will basically in a very nice way, uh, inform me that I'm punching above my weight class. Oh my god! Out, out <laughs> kick my coverage. You know, kind of give me this look like. So what do you got going on? I'm like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm all right, you know. He's packing heat. Um, <laughs> I, I can just <laughs> tell you that, on. like, you know, <laughs> she is equally committed because, I mean, she moved her whole life here. Yeah, right. And I had somebody, somebody was like, oh, she's just going after a green card. I can tell you, she does not like America so far. Like, she much prefers Australian culture. Mm. But it's more important to her to be with the person she loves than to, you know, be in a place she yeah. loves. Because yeah. she knows, she also knows that, like, part of it's just adapting you know, and that she will get there and that she'll like it. But I just kind of had to chuckle about that. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, okay, guy. But, you know, she's just as, in terms of like what she sacrificed and what she's had to do and all that, we're on a level playing field. But for you, that. do you ever get fearful? Like, oh man, you know, I, I got out of a marriage. It ended terribly. Do you ever get scared? Like, what if I'm doing the wrong thing? Does that ever happen? Or are you guys pretty? Well, I mean, every, you know, there's a risk in anything. Yeah. You know, like if even to fall in love is a risk. You know, because it's like anybody who's done it, you're literally like, it's like literally letting go. Do you know what I mean? Like you literally have to let go to fall in love. So if you want falling. Yeah. If you want, I mean, you can get really fucking hurt, you know, but you know, I don't want to look back and live my life and, and, and have, you know, like it's a great partnership right now. And I hope it, you know, and I think that the big thing about her is, She's very self-aware and, and I like to think I'm the same way and we're very focused on trying to improve in terms of how we interact and that sort of thing. And I don't think there's many people out there who do that. You know what I mean? People kind of go, well, I am how I am and you, you need to adapt to me. No, you guys right? seem to have some really good communication. Mm-hmm. You seem to have a really playful relationship but from what you guys show. She's very funny. Yeah. You, like, she's actually really uh, one of the is, most, one of the funniest people I've been around. Which I think it's really important to have that in a relationship. Now, if, if there is something that slips you guys up or causes a fight, is there something typical that you guys are having to work around? Like, You know, we don't really fight much. Like... Every, like she's got her things that annoy me and I've got my things that annoy her. I don't think we've really had like too many fights. What, um, what, what annoys her about you that you're working on? Uh, messy. Oh, are you messy? <laughs> and I tend to be disorganized. So like, uh, even like today, like coming in, she wasn't really clear on what her role was going to be today. Like in terms of like videos and that sort of thing. Like, <laughs> and she, like she has this thing, like, She's very beautiful and she hates the idea of just being like somebody good looking who's put on camera just to be good looking. Right. She wants to be taken seriously because she is very intelligent. Mm -hmm. And I I was, I must have said something that made her think that she was just going to be like the model. The model. (laughs) And she said that. She's like, I don't just want to be a fitness model, you know? And um, because basically she don't want to be unemployed. Uh, it's always funny when I see that on Instagram it says fitness model I'm like so you're unemployed um, 
So yeah, that's a, that's a big thing for, so I do a poor job of sometimes communicating like when I've like, like set up something for business that, that, that probably annoys her. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, but everybody's got their, sh- their shit. You know do you guys I mean? have an assistant or anybody that who keeps you guys uh, organized? Uh, our, our, our assistant, David, he's awesome. David Mathis. I'll give him a shout out. Like he's been, so he can, he actually reached out to us cause he was at, um, I went and spoke to, um, some people in Bill Campbell's lab at USF. Uh, Bill Campbell's a friend of mine and, uh, David was there. David was an army medic who, uh, beat anorexia, like was really, re- like literally went to the hospital, was dying. Mm. Um, he beat anorexia and I know I can talk about this cause we've talked about it before on air. Um, and David actually reached out to us after because we talked like when we were there for for a few minutes, and he was like, you know, I live in I live in the Tampa Bay area. He's like, you know, if you guys ever need anything, like I would just love to help any way I can. And I was like, well, really, we need a lot of help because this is when this was like right in the middle of the shit was hitting the fan and flying all over the room. You know what I mean? So this would have been like uh, October of last year, and man, he's been such a helpful guy. Like, so now he's actually, we, we've kind of groomed him under us and he's actually a coach under bio lane now. So like he's taking on clients and like, he's such a passionate guy and he does such a great job for us. Like, and, and he worked, I couldn't afford to pay him cause I was paying 20 grand to attorneys every month, Ugh. you know, like I couldn't afford to pay him. And I told him like, man, I'm, I can't, I like, I can't afford to pay you all I can offer you is experience right now. He never complained. He never resented us for it. You know, now we're in a position to be able to be able to pay him, and uh, you know he did just as good work when he wasn't getting paid as when he's getting paid. That's cool. You know, he's a great, great guy. So, like, we are we Holly and I talk about how lucky we are to have David in our lives uh, all the time. Like, so you guys are you guys are structuring it in a way where you'll actually have trainers underneath you that are also helping. So is that is there already trainers in place besides him? So just David for now because we okay, don't so have enough we don't have enough spillover just yet. Okay, but yeah, we would like to do that where we've got you know people we trust under us because mm-hmm. one, not everybody can afford our time, right? Sure. But they still want to get somebody that they trust. That that and some people honestly just want to like there were so many people who bought the book just because they like me and want to support me. Uh, who didn't, who weren't even really that interested in the book. They were like, they talk about all the time, like, you guys don't have anything to buy. Like, we just want to, I, I want to uh, support you, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, so if you want to support us right now, you can buy my book and Holly's recipe book. <laughs> but, um, you know, like. Yeah, we gotta um, work on those commercials. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fucking terrible advertiser. I'm like, either don't say anything or buy it, buy it now. <laughs> um, buy but yeah, it's, um, you know, uh, David's been, Awesome. And yeah, we'll like eventually as we bring in people, hopefully people we trust really well. Who's the young guy that videos for you too? I forget. Kabira. 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 Okay, and right. Kabira is awesome. Um, Kabira. Kabira was another guy who came on when I was right in the middle of the shit. Um, and you know, like he. Uh, you can see that transition in the cool videos that you started doing. Yeah. So, you know? so Kabira, Kabira had no experience with, uh, like he just did video editing for fun. And he was like, he was like, tell me, he's like, he lived in Boston. And he was like, man, I would love to come down and do this for you. And you don't have to pay me and, you know, X, Y, Z. And I was like, I'm not gonna let you do that for free and move your whole life, you know. And uh, he sent me a video. He made this like comeback video uh, for me for powerlifting. And it was with, you know, everybody else. It was just footage he took from online. It was fucking awesome. It was awesome. And he said something to me that made me change my mind. Because I was like, dude, you don't like, like, you don't want to be around my life right now. <laughs> my life is a smoldering pile of shit right now. You do not want to be around it. And he was like, dude, that is the best stuff to get right now. People seeing you when you're vulnerable. Do you know how many people that's going to help? And he said, he said a line from Gary Vaynerchuk. He's like, don't just be involved. Don't just do your process. Document the process. He's like, cause that is going to make it so much better. Cause you know, for us, like you guys, people like, yeah, sure. They like the information, but they like you guys. That's why they, they resonate with you guys. Mm-hmm. Right. That's why they're listening to the podcast because you can like some information, but if you don't like the person that's disseminating it, you just go find it somewhere else. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so True. Um, people like and want to support you. So, um, you know, and by it's tough because a lot of people just want to separate personal and business. I'm sorry when you own your own business, it is personal. Well, especially today. You yeah. know what I mean? Today, yeah. today we're in a whole different ballgame. You're your own brand. 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't like that. And I'm, I'm always, I've always been a really open person, you know, so like some things I don't disseminate because of legal reasons and also just for um, just trying to be respectful, 
you know, but, um, yeah, like I, I, I share my stuff in hopes that people will learn from, cause the only way we were born, we're a blank slate, right? The only way you learn is you make mistakes. Either something works or it doesn't work. If it works, you keep doing it. If it doesn't work, you stop doing it. Right. If you're, if you're smart, uh, the, the, be, uh, the better way to do it is watch other people's mistakes and say, Oh, nope, not going to fucking do that. Right. So we know we don't put our hand on the stove, not because we necessarily put our hands on the stove because we saw somebody else put their hands on the stove, mm. right? So yeah, that's kind of why I share this stuff. And but you know, my team, like Kabir is out here now. Andres, our coach, is out here now. He's doing more business with us in terms of making train training templates for BioLane, and he writes a lot of articles for the site. Um, David, Kabira, Andres. You now know, that now that Kabira's came on, have you felt uh, a, like a different energy around your? your audience and the people that are listening to you, are you getting like, because he's starting to show that side of you? Cause I know you have put some videos out there that really have been vulnerable and humanizing. Like, so have you seen the, the tone and the people following you change at all? Or is it still pretty yeah, consistent? I, it's still pretty consistent, but I, you know, I think it's, it's getting more of cross my personality a little bit better, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so it's more representative of who you really are. Yeah, I mean, I after so. one of the last shows that you did with us, we you you switched over a lot of people that didn't like you that that listened to us. That I mean, that what you were you're still today. We actually got a lot of comments. Yeah. yeah, you're still today probably the most talked about person in our private forum. It's awesome because you you do have a polarizing personality, so you still have plenty of people that don't like you. Yeah. But you you yeah. tend to win people over every time you come. But on I, the show. I think what that boils down to is it's like I'm willing to admit when I fuck up or I was wrong. You know, like, mm -hmm. like I can say that, you know, like you guys even said something earlier and you said something and I go, Oh, I don't know. I don't really know much about that. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, at least I can admit it when it happens. There's a lot, man, there's a lot of people who just cannot admit when they've done wrong. Listen, man, when you, when you have passion and conviction and you know, you're gonna have an opinion and you're not, everyone's going to agree with you. If you try to live your life by having everybody agree with you all the time, <laughs> That's a shitty way Say to live, Say nothing, man. do nothing, be nothing. Right. Exactly. Boring. Aristotle. Exactly. You know, my, my mother, she gave me some great advice. Might be, you know, this is, I'll bring it back to mom because I, my mom is one of the strongest people I know. Um, mom's been dealing with um, a health issue for, she's, she's a private person, so I don't want to put it all out there. But she's been dealing with a health issue for about four, four years now. And uh, she's just a fucking tough woman, you know? In fact, my dad... They were talking the other night, and mom, mom said, Dad turned to her, and Dad said, uh, you know, Ellen, you're the toughest lady I know. I've been with you for 43 years, and you're the toughest woman I know. And I would say that is 100. Even Holly, when she met my mom, she goes, the first time they met was not a, it was it was very uh, high stress. We'll just put it that way. Oh, wow. But they get along great now. And she, she said to me, she's like, honey, your mom is one of the toughest ladies I've ever met. But mom said to me when I was 15 years old, because I had my peers you know, didn't accept me. And I just, I, I was so caught up in like trying to make people happy and trying to please people. And I'm still that way to a little extent. I'm a very empathetic person. So I tend to, if people are unhappy around me or unhappy with me, I tend to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, she said, honey, some people are going to hate you just for breathing, just for existing, just for being who you are. And it doesn't matter how much you try to please them. So you might as well be who you are. And at least you know that the people like you, like you for who you really are, and the people who don't like you, at least they don't like you for who you really are. It's like, I like a line uh, from a Five Finger Death Punch song, I think he said, <laughs> I'd rather you hate me for everything I am than love me for something I'm not. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of how I feel. Like, you know. Would you say that's one of the best traits that you picked up from your mother? Yeah, and hard work. My well, parents are very hardworking people. They're very passionate people. And definitely very opinionated, hard-headed people. You know, like, you don't have... My mom's from the Eisman side, and we always say, you don't have to ask an Eisman what their opinion is because they're telling it to you. Mm. You know, my grandfather was like my hero. And growing up, like, the most intelligent man I've ever met, greatest generation, World War II, like, legitimate war hero. No, although he'd never talk about it. I have it. a lot of respect for people that you speak know? their mind, though. I Papo, don't think Papo, now looking back, like, fuck, Papo would have been a hard person to deal with. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But, like... Man, you want to, t there's nobody who has actually, he had so much heart, you know, even though he's kind of like salty, you know, sea dog kind of personality, he had so much heart underneath that. And actually one of the best, one of my best friends, his name's Ed Lebrecht and he's not on social media or anything like that, but he's, he's a very good friend to me and I respect him a great deal. Maybe he'll listen and hear this, but he gave me probably the best compliment I've ever gotten. And he said, 
because he's known a lot of guys in Navy SEALs and like a lot of really good men. He said, dude, when I was going through like the worst part of my life, he said, I got to tell you this, man. He's like, I've known a lot of really good men. He said, you've got more heart than anybody I've ever met. And he said, you just, you care a lot about people. And he's like, sometimes it gets you in trouble. And sometimes you say shit that you probably shouldn't. So a lot of times when I get angry about like online or whatever, it's because I'm passionate about defending people from getting the wrong information and having people tell them the wrong shit. Probably comes out wrong. Probably dropped too many F-bombs. But you know what? I'm always going to, I'm going to try and do it my way. Because mm-hmm. when I'm 80 years old, I'm hopefully 80 years old and dying. Um, you know, I want to be able to look back and, you know, Frank Sinatra say, you know what? I did it my way. That's it. Do you know what, do you know what trait that you've picked up from your parents that you, you don't so much like about yourself? Uh, probably if I had a chance to think about that. Um, well, I know I'm more like my mother than my father. And I, I think that your best traits and your worst traits are almost always right up against each other. Right. So the thing that people will absolutely love about you also produces something that they're not going to like about you. Right. So like your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. Yeah. So like, um, like I'm a really hardworking person and very passionate. And sometimes that probably gets the better of me. You know what I mean? Uh, I probably, I probably jump a little bit too quick, you know, to defend something. And I, I'll even do it on Twitter. Like I've apologized to some people because like, oh, I'm, I actually mis- misread what you said. I'm sorry that that was wrong. Um, but yeah, like I said, the, the, I would think that happens quite a bit because that happened to me a few times when I first started getting on Instagram and I was responding to people after I do kind of like controversial posts and realized that some people were just like, you just, you can't tell. There's no uh, yeah, sarcasm. Yeah. Doesn't come yeah, out yeah, well yeah, in text. You're joking. You have no yeah, idea. and then I like rip them. Like, and yeah, then I'm yeah. like, oh shit! Like, yeah. you're a fan, and you like, and you were like just being funny, and I didn't pick up yeah, on. that. Somebody was like, kind of, uh, we th- like Holly thought somebody was crushing me about my my personal life about what had happened, and she was like typing up this response to just rip this person a new one, you know. And I looked at the post. I'm like, no, babe, they're actually being supportive. Don't don't say that, you know, like. Um, yeah, I, I you know my parents. Um, yeah, I would say my mom, my mom. I love my mom, and she's a wonderful person. But she would be a difficult person to live with. There's a reason I moved away when I was 18 years old. But I love my mother very much. That is not me saying I don't like my mom or I don't love my mom. I love my. Could mom. you make that clear? She's a big mind pump listener. <laughs> <laughs> she probably will listen to it. She probably will. Um, but she's a very, very strong personality, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of the same way. So, you know, but I, I really like, yeah, but you wouldn't want to get rid of that trait, you know, no, that's, a, that's, I mean, an, that's, impor- the thing. that's like, an important trait. Like, like, um, actually like Holly said something like, cause one time I'm like, look, I know mom can be, you know, live over, and Holly said, she's like, no, it's okay. She's like, she cares. She's like, I, she's, and she even comments on my family. She's like, I, she's like, I love your family. She's like, I've never met people who care more than your family, you know? So it's like whenever mom's like getting a little bit overbearing or whatever, Holly goes, well, that's because she cares, Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm probably a little bit like that, a little bit the same way, you know? I think relationships are the best place to find these things, you know? Like I I didn't realize- amazing the differences between people. Oh yeah. I mean, I I, I have a relationship with Katrina that's, we're so polar opposite the way we were raised with our families. Like every decision that that they make, they get to, they gather together and they decide as a family and they all live close together. And like, I was the complete opposite. Yeah, she's like that. Oh yeah. So it's really challenging for me because- you know, they'll have, you know, every, every weekend there's a family get together and I just don't, I wasn't raised doing that. And it's almost, it's borderline uncomfortable for me, yeah. even, though, even though we've been together for a really long time and I don't like to be antisocial or be like a bah humbug about things, but it's just how I was raised. So that's a trait that I think of that I have because of the way I was raised that I wish I could get rid of because I wish that I could enjoy being, and, and over years, I think I've kind of trained myself to try and let, let let loose and enjoy it more. But you more of an introvert? I'm not. That's what's funny. That's mm. what's really weird is that I'm just, I'm just extroverted. To... But when it comes to family stuff, yeah, maybe I am because I we didn't I wasn't around my cousins and aunts and uncles and my you know my my family kept us really tight and just our family and we didn't let a lot of people in and my parents didn't really socialize a lot with friends and so 
getting older and then getting in a relationship where someone is that is their family is everything. Yeah. It's it's a it's a tough transition for sure. Speaking of the devil, she's actually outside the building right now. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> Good time to end. Yeah. Yeah, well, awesome. hey man, always a great time having you on. Yep. The fucking oh, I love show, it. dude. I yeah. love it. You yeah. guys, you know, like I said, people people ask me about you guys and like how we get along and I'm like, you know what? You can have different opinions about things, but good people are good people. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. you guys, all of you like reached out to me when you knew things were kind of going bad in my life and asked if there was anything you could do. I know Sal called me, mm-hmm. you know, like that's how I judge people. Not on whether you like carbs or fats or whatever. You know what I mean? That's what I, good people are good people. You know what I mean? And that's, that's what makes a difference. And uh, I can just tell you guys, anybody listening, these guys have always treated me way better than they had to. And uh, I consider it a, a big time privilege every time they have me on the show, and I, I love doing it. Oh, appreciate awesome. it. Thanks, Thanks very much, brother. Thanks. Thanks, man. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.